Welcome to the August 31st, uh, 2017 meeting of the Little Rock Planning Commission. I want to welcome everyone here as we convene. Uh, I don't have the agenda up, but I'll, I'll, I'll wing this. Do, do I need a motion for approval of the amendments? Or How about I call roll first? There we, that would there be good. Is. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We're lost roll our call. Okay. <laughs> Chairman Barry? Here. Vice Chair Bubbas? Here. Commissioner Bynum? Here. Commissioner Cox? Here. Commissioner Dillon? Commissioner Finney? Here. Commissioner Hamilton? Here. Commissioner Leahy? Here. Commissioner Latour? Here. Commissioner Steppens? Here. Commissioner May? You have 10 members present. You do have a quorum. Now you can do your minutes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Uh, do I hear a motion for approval of the minutes of the July 20, 20th meeting, please? Yes, I move for approval of the meeting minutes from July 20th. I'll second. We have a motion that's been seconded for approval of the minutes of the July 20th, 2017 meeting. Do I uh, those approve? Signify by raising your hand. Those opposed? Minutes have been approved. Okay. Now we can proceed to the consent agenda, please. Little Rock Planning Commission, subdivision consent agenda, August 31st, 2017. Items for consent withdrawal, item six, file number Z-2502-E, Hogland edition revised long form PCD, located on the southwest corner of West 40th Street and Whitfield Street. The applicant submitted a request dated July 31st, 2017, requesting withdrawal of this item Without prejudice, staff is supportive of the withdrawal request. Items for consent deferral, item D, file number Z-5817-I, 15,000 Cantrell Road, short form PDC, located at 15,000 Cantrell Road. The applicant submitted a request dated August 15, 2017, requesting deferral of this item to the October 12, 2017 public hearing. Staff is supportive of the deferral request. Item number E, File number Z-6323-X, The Village at Rowling Road, Revised Long Form PCD, located on the southwest corner of Rowling Road and Rowling Circle. The applicant submitted a request supportive of the deferral request. Item number 13, file number Z-9247, 7624 Colonel Glen Road, short form PCD, located at 7624 Colonel Glen Road. The applicant submitted a request dated August 28, 2017, requesting deferral of this item to the October 12, 2017 public hearing. Staff is supportive of the deferral request. The deferral request will require a waiver of the Commission's bylaws with regard to the late deferral request. Items for consent approval. Item C, file number S-293-A, Waterford Apartments, revised subdivision site plan review, located at 701 Green Mountain Drive. Staff recommends approval of the request, subject to the applicant providing to traffic engineering detailed drawings on the sign location and dimensions for approval prior to the issuance of a sign permit. Staff recommends approval of the variance from section 36552 to allow an increase in the height and sign area for the two signs to serve the existing multifamily development. Item number F, file number Z-8643-A, M&K Incorporated, short form PCD, Located at 7020 Colonel Glen Road, staff recommends approval of the request subject to compliance with the comments and conditions as outlined in paragraphs D, E, and F of the agenda staff report. Item number G, file number Z-9228, Combs, short form PDC. Located at 9010 Hilaro Springs Road, staff recommends approval of the request subject to compliance with the comments and conditions as outlined in paragraphs D, E, and F of the agenda staff report. Item number one, File number S-1797, Northern Tool Edition, Preliminary Final Plat, located at 10100 Interstate 30. Staff recommends approval of the request, subject to compliance with the comments and conditions, as outlined in paragraphs D, E, and F of the Agenda Staff Report. Item number two, file number S-1798, Lamarche Place Villas, Preliminary Plat, located on the northeast corner of Forest Lane and Lamarche Drive. Staff recommends approval of the request, subject to compliance with the comments and conditions as outlined in paragraphs D, E, and F of the agenda staff report. Staff recommends approval of the variance request from the land alteration ordinance to allow grading of the development with the installation of the basic infrastructure. Item number three, file number S-207-C, Bowman Heights Apartments, revised subdivision site plan review, located at 420 Markham Mesa Place, Staff recommends approval of the request to allow modification to the previously approved signage plan as proposed by the applicant. 
Staff recommends approval of the variance from section 36552 to allow an increase in the height and sign area for the existing multifamily development. Item number four, S-344-Q, Lisa Academy Subdivision Site Plan Review, located at 12200 West Haven Drive. Staff recommends approval of the request, subject to compliance with the comments and conditions, as outlined in paragraphs D, E, and F of the agenda staff report. Item number five, file number Z-4470-J, Chennault Park Center Zoning Site Plan Review, located at 15200 Chennault Parkway. Staff recommends approval of the request, subject to compliance with the comments and conditions, as outlined in paragraphs D, E, and F of the agenda staff report. Staff recommends approval of the variance request from section 36-300E to allow a reduced side yard setback on the eastern perimeter. Staff recommends approval of the variance request to allow reduced parking as indicated on the site plan. And staff recommends approval of the requested waiver of the order board screening requirement. Item number seven, file number Z-4377-A. South Oaks Apartments Revised Long Form PDR, located at 3401 Fair Park Boulevard. Staff recommends approval of the request to allow a modification to the previously approved signage plan as proposed by the applicant. Item number eight, file number Z-6079-I, Little Rock Christian Academy Revised Long Form POD, located at 19010 Cantrell Road. Staff recommends approval of the request, subject to compliance with the comments and conditions, as outlined in paragraphs D, E, and F of the agenda staff report. Staff recommends approval of the deferral request of the Boundary Street Ordinance requirement for the required street improvements to Cantrell Road until the development of the education building. Staff recommends approval of the variance request from the city's land alteration ordinance to allow grading of future phases with the development site with the construction of the indoor athletic field and baseball facility. Staff recommends approval of the variance request of the land use buffer along the western perimeter of the site where adjacent to the energy easement and transmission line. Item number nine, file number Z-7905-B, the Fountain Short Form PCD, located at 2809 Cavanaugh Boulevard. Staff recommends approval of the request, subject to compliance with the comments and conditions as outlined in paragraphs D, E, and F of the agenda staff report. Staff recommends the development continue to comply with the 2006 Zoning Board of Adjustments conditions as follows. There is to be no outdoor speaker or amplification for the outdoor seating deck area. The employees of the fountain are to park in the Delta Trust parking lot. The fountain is to place signs on the front door window at 2809 Cavanaugh Boulevard informing customers of available parking in the Delta Trust parking lot. The deck is to be four feet from the southern property line to allow the underside south side of the structure to be screened with lattice and planter boxes. Item number 10, file number Z-9244, Rival Cove Long Form PDR, located at 15700 Pride Valley Road. Staff recommends approval of the request, subject compliance with the comments and conditions as outlined in paragraphs D, E, and F of the agenda staff report. Staff recommends approval of the variance request from the city's land alteration ordinance to allow grading of the lots with the installation of the basic infrastructure for the subdivision. And item number 11, files number Z-9245, 5615 L Street, short form PDR. Located at 5615 L Street, staff recommends approval of the request, subject to compliance with the comments and conditions as outlined in paragraphs D, E, and F of the agenda staff report. And that concludes the consent agenda. Thank you, staff. Do I hear a motion on a bylaw waiver for item 13 first? Yes, I'd like to make a motion for a bylaw waiver for item 13 for late deferral. Thank you. A second? Second. All right, we have a motion to waive the bylaw so we can defer item 13 uh, till what time? October 12th. Um, those approved signify by saying or raising their hand. Those do not approve? Okay. Motion passes a prop for bylaw waiver. I move for approval of the consent agenda with all staff recommendations and comments. Okay. We have a second? second. Okay. We have a motion that's been seconded for approval of the consent agenda as read with all staff recommendations. Those approve, raise your hand. Those who do not. Okay. The consent agenda has been read. Uh, for those of you that uh, items were consent or deferral, 
or withdrawal, you may be excused uh, and, and uh, get ready for the football game. <laughs> and um, we'll get started in just a minute for the regular agenda. While we were transitioning here, I think I saw some fellow citizens who, who uh, filled out a green card while walking in. So if you've got a green card, please uh, bring it up here. That'd be great. Uh, Barbara Lawsh, I just got your card. Uh, I'm trying to figure out which item. You're... Okay. Before we get started on reading item, I, I want to remind, this is, uh, of course, was deferred from a, a previous time, and I appreciate it for those who came back. Uh, just want to remind you of... of uh, our long-standing practice that each side has 20 minutes. I have, I have numerous cards for item A in opposition to it. And it would be, I would wager we're not going to get to everyone in this stack of cards. I would, I suspect everyone will be saying very similar things. So I, I don't want you to think your voice is being squelched, but for respect for all speakers, for this item and other items on the agenda after you, uh, I think this is a, a, a fair system for you. So be thinking about uh, whether or not you want to speak or if it's things have been said for you. Uh, if you had submitted a card, I'm not going to uh, call on you. This, this is not going to be a, a food fight, uh, Sean Hannity style. So uh, <laughs> there is some linear progression because we do make decisions uh, on all these applications. So. Uh, with that said, let's get started, Donna. I'm going to introduce the item, and then uh, Nat, Traffic Engineering, is going to come up and show a presentation, and then they'll come back to me to conclude the staff recommendation. That's right. Okay. Item A, file number Z-7500-F, Hamilton Apartments Long Form PDR, located behind 14524 through 14810 Cantrell Road. The request is a rezoning of the site from R2 single family and PCD plan commercial development to PDR, plan development residential, to allow the development of a 10.67 acre site with multifamily development containing 250 units. The development is proposed with two interior courtyards which will contain a swimming pool, outdoor cooking areas, sports courts, and seating areas. The building exterior finish will be a combination of masonry and architectural cementation panels. Hmm, didn't mess that one up. The roof will have a residential pitch and will be covered with architectural shingles. The maximum height proposed is 50 feet on the south side, 60 feet on the north. The site plan uh, indicates a total building footprint of 98,925 square feet. Uh, the development is proposed in a single phase. The site plan includes 442 parking spaces, 22 of which will be under the building in the basement. The plan indicates of the 442 parking spaces, 36 are garages, 206 covered carport structures, and 178 open spaces um, or uncovered spaces. The, based on the typical ordinance requirement for parking for a multifamily, 342 parking spaces would typically be required. The site plan includes a recreational area between the parking lot and the floodway, and the developer is considering creating walking trails along the creek. The plan includes the placement of a dog park, detention pond with pavilion, picnic tables, and a park. The plan includes a small area for vegetable garden plots. The plan indicates the placement of six-foot-high perimeter fence constructed of a decorative aluminum. There will be brick and stone columns at the main entrances to the development, and development is proposed as a gated community. The applicant indicates the western driveway is the primary access to the development. The west driveway connects to the light at Taylor Loop and Cantrell Road. The applicant states the existing driveway will be, will be expanded to allow 36 feet of pavement. The applicant proposes to close one of the access openings to the parking lot to Pinnacle Creek Retail Center on the west side of the access easement drive. And the applicant agrees to construct sidewalks on the west side of the access drive from the ramp to the new development. 
The back out parking currently located in the access drive will be removed and striped as a no parking zone and then Matt, Nat's going to come forward. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, my name is Nat Bonietti. I'm with the Traffic Engineering Division. <clears throat> um, I'm going to give you a small presentation on how this development is going to impact the traffic flow on Cantrell and at the intersection of Cantrell Road and Taylor Loop. <clears throat> um, first of all, this, is, uh, sh this shows the general location where the apartments are going to be. It's on the northeast corner of Cantrell and Taylor Loop. If you know the Walgreens pizza cafe area is somewhat behind that. <clears throat> and this map shows the traffic counts, the daily, average daily traffic volume on Cantrell Road. This is from 2015. It's from the highway department traffic counts map. Probably the latest uh, traffic counts may have increased somewhat. If you look at the counts, <clears throat> it's 26,000 vehicles to the east, I mean to the west, and 38,000 vehicles to the east of this intersection. So you can probably say at the intersection, it's probably around 30, 32,000 east-west combined. <clears throat> Next. And this slide shows the actual turn movement counts at the intersection, you know, how many vehicles are turning left, going through. So if you look at the numbers that are circled in red, those are some of the critical conflicting movements. At this intersection, we have a very heavy westbound left turn from Cantrell going to Taylor Loop South and also northbound left turns from Taylor Loop going west on Cantrell. So those two are conflicting movements. That means you have to stop one to let the other go. In addition to this, we have a lot of east-west through movements. And this, this, uh, <clears throat> these numbers are only for the AM. Um, I think the kid got bored with my presentation. <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> so maybe I'll bring some cartons next time. <clears throat> um, but anyway, if you look at the, you know, the numbers, uh, we are dealing with very heavy left turns. So uh, left turns are basically what kill the capacity of intersections. If you have through movements, you know, they, they can occur at the same time. East-West can occur at the same time. But when you have left turns, you have to stop the other directions. And <clears throat> as you see in the subsequent you know, slides, uh, we'll discuss that next, next slides, please. <clears throat> and this one shows the current zoning, the approved zoning. <clears throat> That's a single family residential and office warehouse. And based on the drip generation, we have a total of 860 estimated you know, traffic, <clears throat> 24 hour volumes and if you look at the top you know the red circle you have with the current approved zoning you have very few left turns coming out of the development it's only 20 in the peak hour <clears throat> but if we change the zoning to multifamily the apartments you can see the increase in the trip generation it's pretty much doubles the daily volume 1649 and then the left turns also increased significantly, five-fold actually, <clears throat> about 101, you know, coming out of. It's not entirely left turns, but, but most of it is probably going to be left turn coming towards the city. So these numbers, you know, show how the traffic volume is going to increase with the proposed zoning. Next slide. And currently that intersection is pretty bad. You know, the level of service is pretty bad. You have, when you talk about level of levels of service, you start with A, 
A means it's perfect. There's no delay for any approach. You know, it's very little traffic, so you don't wait any, any time at all. <clears throat> but as you go down A, B, C, D, this is at E. This intersection is level of service E, which is pretty bad. And with the proposed zoning, with uh, the projected traffic, it's going to get to even worse level E. Next slide. And this one actually is a simulation of the traffic, you know, on how this is not the exact scenario, but when you plug in the numbers and, uh, you know, check where the queuing is going to be with the existing timings and with the increased traffic with the proposed zoning, you see on the north leg there on the top of the screen, the traffic is going to back up into the driveway there because we are not changing any timing. We are trying to, you know, keep the traffic moving on Cantrell. But when you do that, there will be a lot of uh, backup on Terrell Loop on the north side. <clears throat> so you can see the queuing. This, this will be over in a few seconds. Yeah, you can see on the north leg on Taylor Loop, the vehicles are queuing. And now, obviously, people will call us and complain that, you know, we need more time to get out. So when we do that, the next slide will show the problem. This is still this, you know, the queuing on the north leg. You can see, you know, the traffic waiting to get out onto Cantrell. I think we have reached the end of this slide, the next one. Just go to page down. I think we are still on the previous slide. Okay, now if you optimize the signal to allow you know, traffic from the new development, what will happen is the east-west movement will have to be stopped to allow the new traffic. So now, during the AM, all the traffic that is coming towards town, they will be stopped, basically, you know, if you give more time. The problem with uh, signals is you can't create additional time. You have to basically take time from one approach to give to another approach. You can't, you know, start creating time. You have only 60 seconds in a minute, so you have to take time from one approach and give it to another. And in this case, we are taking time away from Cantrell Road and giving it to Taylor Loop. So now you see the eastbound traffic during morning is going to be basically, you know, experiencing a lot of delay. <clears throat> so you, you basically have to decide, you know, which is the major flow there. And obviously, Cantrell Road is the major flow. and. Uh, we try to make sure that they're not experiencing, you know, significant delay because uh, once they stop, it takes a long time for the platoon to start moving. You don't see a long queue on the north side on Taylor Loop, but you're experiencing significant queuing on Cantrell. <clears throat> And obviously, this, if you have been there, it's a pretty big problem in the morning. And the same scenario, you know, it will happen in the evening, but the queuing will be on the westbound side. So we can probably go to the next slide now. <clears throat> and the other thing to note is none of these intersections, you, you don't look at them as isolated intersections. These are not like way out in the county, just one intersection by itself. These are all part of a system. They're all timed together for, you know, progression. They all communicate with each other and they work together. It's kind of like a dance group, you know. Everybody is coordinating with everybody else. You can't just change, you know, one signal here and just leave it at that. You have to make changes at every intersection. So it becomes very difficult when you make adjustments to one signal. So you need to look at this as a system, not 
just one intersection. <coughs> Next. So in summary, the intersection level of service is pretty bad now, and introducing additional conflicting traffic will make it worse. And maintaining existing signal timings to keep the east-west you know, traffic flow smooth will increase queuing on the driveway. And if you give more time to the driveway, it will worsen the traffic on Cantrell. So we'll be dealing with a lot of you know, problems, complaints, people you know, getting mad. Um, so that is, in essence, you know, how this uh, development is going to affect the traffic. <clears throat> and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Commissioner Cox. Do you know the time schedule for the highway department's plan widening of Highway 10? Uh, I unfortunately don't know the exact, you know, time frame, but it's several years, you know, at least three to four years. Is that my guess? Mike? Yeah, okay. Mike is nodding his head, so. <clears throat> it's still in the planning stages. They're working on some, you know, final configurations and taking, I, I think the public meetings have already been over. But uh, as you know, the highway department, you know, anything with federal highway, highways, they always say, you know, it'll be two years, three years, but it can take five, seven years, who knows. <clears throat> Any other questions of Public Works? Okay, let's proceed back to Donna. Staff is not supportive of the applicant's request. The PCD zoning portion of the development was previously approved as roughly half of the development and was approved for approximately 40,500 square feet of office warehouse. This area is indicated on the future land use plan as transitional. The remainder of the property is currently zoned and indicated on the land use plan for single family at a density which would not exceed six units per acre. The developer is proposed, uh, development is proposed containing a total of 10.67 acres and 250 units for an overall density of 23.4 units per acre. In staff's opinion, this development is proposed extremely dense and is not appropriate for the site. With the exception of the Cantrell Road frontage, which is predominantly commercial, the areas off of Cantrell are single family residential. In recent past, there have been a couple developments of a similar development style which have been approved, but both of those were on property that was zoned to allow for a more dense multifamily development. Uh, staff is not supportive. Staff does not feel this uh, location is appropriate for multifamily development as proposed by the developer, and staff recommends de denial of the request. Okay. Thank you, staff. We have four cards. Uh, for this application and we have 18 cards against. I will ask the applicant to come up, applicant to come up first. And if he wish, uh, wishes to uh, make his presentation or state his case uh, or yield uh, his time first to uh, to those that are speaking for. So um, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and speak first okay. and then we'll intersperse them when we have time. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Chairman Barry and the members of the committee. Thank you for hearing our uh, petition for the Hamilton. Um, uh, there's a picture on the screen that, um, it, let's see here, there was a picture on the screen. Okay, this is a picture of the property. Uh, you can see uh, how a quality, it's a quality, very, very quality type property. That's for 250 units. It's it's the same style as the Madison that was uh, that was approved down on uh, Chanel and Canis. We have the same architect, same probably the same builder. Uh, the the rents down there are going to be from a th from $900, probably $1,500 or $1,600 a month. We're going to obviously check everybody that comes in, make sure that they're that they're uh, pass our scrutiny to be there. So notice all I'm trying to say there is that we're going to have a quality development. It'll be very high end. Uh, similar to the River House down in the Riverdale area and uh, the, the Madison and, and then this one. So um, we feel like it's a great spot for this location and because, uh, as you all know, West Little Rock uh, is growing to further to the west. It used to, Mississippi used to be the furthest road out. And uh, then it used to, well, University and then Mississippi. Well, now it's past 430 and it's going to be out to Chanel and, and Highway 10. 
in the next five to ten years. So people need to have a place to live. This is this this type of development is exactly what the uh, the millennials, anywhere from 20 to 35, they really want this type of space. They would like to be dense. And you know, before this time right today, the, the I've always heard from the from from the uh, uh, the staff, and uh, thank you for giving that report, Donna, but I've always heard from the staff that they want kind of like an infield type development, and so you could walk to or bike to de development. Well, this is exactly what this is. We have our shopping centers. I've got two shopping centers in front of this space, that Pinnacle Creek and Pinnacle Station, about 26,000 square feet each. We've got restaurants. Whole Hog is getting ready to open this, this, this week. We also have, um, uh, we, we've got uh, urgent care in there. We've got Forbidden Gardens. We've got these restaurants that they can walk over there, which is going to decrease the traffic. You know, they do talk about traffic, and yes, unless we want to stop any development in West Little Rock, and if we want to do that, then, then it's going to be really a sad thing for Little Rock because that means nothing else can be built out there because anything that's built is going to bring traffic to the area. And we understand it's going to bring some traffic, but not much. And I think I'll, my uh, traffic engineer, Ernie, will talk about that in a minute. But um, we feel like that this is a great property. And, and, and th as you'll see up here, now these are some of the properties that I have. I've been developing in Little Rock for over 20, 25 years. And we have several properties, ma mainly shopping centers. You should see there's Whole Foods and uh, Quest, Quest School and my office building and uh, Cedric Center. And uh, also that's the center there in Bryant's whole hog there. So we have a lot of shopping centers. And I think if you would go around looking at the ones we've developed, we've done a pretty good job. And we always keep our units nice and clean. And that's what we want to do. And I say that is because sometimes people say, well, they're going to, some New York developer is going to come in and build, and build this center. And then they'll be gone and not be there to, you know, to do anything about it if there's, if there's a problem. Well, we live in West Little Rock. And we have, my family is out here. My daughter's got a store in one of our developments right there at Pinnacle Creek, uh, the Companions Dress Store. And we have a lot of interest in there. I've got two shopping centers there that I'm, I'm, I'm this is going to be a good thing. I've had every tenant, I think just about every tenant in those two centers have told me, John, we want it, we need it, we need the extra traffic. You know, retail's not that good. We need to have people walking up. And we're going to have a passageway there they can walk up and uh, to get to our center so they can shop there and do this. And this is a type of infill that the city has always said, this is what we want. This is what we want. And so now they don't want it. But so anyway, I, I just think that uh, uh, this talks about, you can see up here the Hamilton, it's, uh, it's a 25 to 30, $30 million investment. And so it's going to be, you know, last year I came before the board and we were thinking about building an office warehouse. And so it was because of the traffic, it was right past the, the Murphy Oil deal, you know, and everybody was all concerned about the traffic then, and I understand that. And, of course, it did get passed, and so I came in right after that, so there was a really lot of concern. So the office warehouse had twice as much traffic as this particular development has. So I, I said, well, what's, what can I do to be the least traffic generator? And Ernie said, well, you know, your apartments is about half what, what that was. So there's nothing else, basically, unless you go single family, that you could put in there. And single families are going to be about two hundred fifty thousand dollars a unit after I get through, after I get through. If I did a development and six units, it can't, it, it won't work. It just won't, will not work. And besides that, who wants to be located and build next to shopping centers? The, the city would have never approved that. If I went out there and said I wanted to get this zone residential. And, and it was office, they say, no, you can't do that. I know they do that because they're not going to put residential. That's why it's zone, it's in the transition zone. That's what it means, transition between one heavier zoning, which is on the front, is your commercial. So we're transitioning between commercial and the residential on the north side and the, and the west side. So, and, and those two developments, as you'll see in a minute when uh, Ernie, Rick, uh, when Frank Riggins gets up, are 200 and 300 feet away. They can't see us, but they have to get on top of their house over there if we were at Mr. Wingfield's development, and they'd have to get on top of their house, and they'd still be, to be able to see the top of our roof. So it's not something that they're going to, I don't think, see or hear or uh, taste or touch or whatever you might want to call it. We're, we're going to be incognito, basically, to, to those people. And we're going to be good neighbors. That's what we want to be. I mean, we're, 
we've been good neighbors every time if something happens we want to be good neighbors and we but but also the, there's a lot of people that are not here tonight that are standing right here beside me and they're saying we need this they say we need it and and and, and, and but they're but they're not here because you know, most of the time when you're against something, you come out. But when you're for something, they say, I hope it gets passed. I hope, and that's what a lot of people told me. I hope this gets passed, John. We need this. It's a good thing for the city of Little Rock. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, stop for just a second. I want uh, Marcus Elliott to come forward. And uh, he, he's an advocate for the public schools. And I want to get his two cents in here. Thanks, John. Uh, football game is important. Uh, but, but tonight's important to me, too. I'm first... I'm a friend uh, of John Reeves, and I, I vouch for him as a person, uh, as a friend in our relationship over the years. Also, I'm, I live in the ranch, so I'm familiar with traffic. I'm familiar with that area. But I stand with him on the Hamilton for a couple of reasons. One, I think growth and progress in our city is important. But one of the main reasons it's important, Chairman, is, is for our young people, and our schools. You know, it's my understanding that potentially $300,000 a year in taxes will be paid from this project. For me, that's important because schools are important to the growth of cities. They're important to crime. They're important to making a difference in lives. And I think this has a, an opportunity not only to serve the purpose of of growth in our city that's happening anyway. Get people somewhere to live, but a byproduct is we'll be able to support our public schools better. We're in the middle right now of a project where we gotta raise money so we can implement a football program that was taken away from the school district because of lack of revenues. Guess what? The revenue from this project would cover that program. Now, thank God, we've got some wonderful people that see vision and see the impact of our school systems on our young people, and they're stepping up and filling the gap. But this is a way we can meet a need of a growing city in addition to helping our young people. Everybody benefits. So, yeah, I live out there, so my traffic may increase a little bit. But the big picture is our young people are going to benefit from the revenues being driven from this project. I support it. Thank you, Marcus. I'm gonna let Ernie Peters uh, come forward and talk about the traffic, and he'll do that right now. Thank you, John. Okay. Chairman Barry and commissioners, I'm Ernie Peters with Peters Associates Engineers. Most of you know me. I've been here before. Uh, in fact, I've been in Little Rock for a lot of years and practiced in this area for as many years as I've been in Little Rock, which is over 30. Uh, but it's my pleasure tonight to, or this afternoon, to uh, speak to you and try to answer any questions you may have concerning this development relative to traffic. Uh, as John has indicated, uh, residential single family development on this track is not practical. Uh, it's not a good location for that. Uh, if he were to develop it as single family, he likely could not market it because of the infrastructure and land costs that he would have to recover. But as he also indicated, he had been before this board uh, some time ago with a uh, office warehouse development. And one of the reasons that it drew opposition uh, was because of uh, the traffic generation associated with it. So we began to look at what alternate land uses could be considered and be practical and could allow John to develop this property and uh, have a uh, high and, and good use of it. And we came to the conclusion that uh, multifamily is a very good fit. It fits into that transition area, transition from the commercial or office to residential areas with multifamily. And it generates uh, uh, roughly half what the uh, alternative office uh, warehouse development could generate. Now, Mr. Vanahati, uh, I appreciate his presentation, and he presented to you a summary of the trip generation associated with that uh, possible combination of single family and uh, the, plant, the, the existing PRD development. And it's true that on a daily basis, uh, that 
traffic would generate, that, that use would generate about half what these apartments would, 860 versus uh, 1,600 or so. But what uh, Mr. Van Ohani did not point out is that the difference in trip generation during the peak hours when you compare those two, it was only an increase of uh, about 20 cars in the a.m. peak hour combined entering and exiting and an increase of only about 30 cars in the p.m. peak hour combined entering and exiting. Those are respectively 20 cars during an hour in the a.m. peak hour, about one additional vehicle every three minutes. And during the p.m. peak hour, an increase of about 30, about uh, two additional vehicles per minute during the p.m. peak hour. So the difference is not much. I appreciate Mr. Benahati's analysis. However, uh, you may not have recognized that in his data, his turning movement count data was dated 2014. That preceded the opening of La Marche, which has diverted a lot of traffic uh, from this intersection. Uh, our analysis and all that we did in our analysis report that we present, presented and provided to the city included updated turning movement counts at this intersection of Taylor Loop. And our findings are that uh, the queuing would not be anything like he depicted in the simulation model. Um, we used the city's existing signal timing in that Highway 10 corridor, and as Mr. Banahani pointed out, it is a coordinated system, so we locked in the timing. We added to the existing volumes that we counted recently for the intersection, not using the 2014 data, but, but 2017 data. We added to that the full build of this uh, 250 units of apartments, and we do not see the queuing that he's depicted there. We see uh, the worst case that five or six vehicles might queue up on the north leg, but I point out that that is on site, that's on that private street that is opposite Taylor Loop. And so if any congestion manifests itself, <clears throat> it does so on site. It does not negatively impact uh, the operation of the intersection. Uh, I could talk a lot more about traffic, but we are somewhat limited on time and there are others that want to speak. I'd be glad to answer any questions now or later, should there be any. Um, but otherwise, I'll defer to our, uh, our next uh, speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ernie. I appreciate that presentation. And now I'm going to let Frank Riggins with Craft and Toll talk about um, how we're going to talk about the water and drainage and all that. I'm Frank Reggins with Craft and Tall Engineers. We are the civil engineer for uh, the Hamilton Apartments. Uh, Ms. James made a, a great presentation and, and covered a lot of uh, the, uh, the territory that I was going to present to you just concerning the quantitative data about the project. There's a couple of other uh, things I do want to, uh, to touch on. Uh, if we could, yes, bring up this site plan here. One of the things I wanted to, uh, to say was uh, the building and the parking uh, combined uh, represent about 56% uh, coverage to the site. That leaves about 44% of open space. Uh, we are uh, preserving a 41-foot undisturbed buffer along uh, our west boundary, uh, adjacent to Mr. Wingfield's uh, development uh, to the west. Uh, we are also uh, not proposing to do any work in the floodway, which is that uh, uh, in and of itself is a is a unpreserved uh, buffer then uh, against uh, those houses to the north along Pinnacle Valley uh, Drive. So I wanted to uh, bring that to your, uh, your attention. Um, one of the things I also wanted to touch on uh, were, the, were the sight lines uh, in and from uh, the site. Uh, if we could have that slide, please. It shows those sections cut through the site. Uh, here's one uh, looking from uh, our development uh, to the west to Mr. Wingfield's property. Uh, this represents, uh, if you were standing on the top floor uh, of our building, uh, looking over a 40-foot obstacle. Uh, there are some very mature specimens, uh, some dense growth there in that undisturbed buffer. Uh, and the house uh, would have to be approximately 40 feet tall to be able to see the backside of that house. Vice versa, uh, the house then uh, would have a, 
have an obstructed view of our project as well. Looking to the north, the same uh, situation uh, really applies. Uh, looking at those houses that are existing across the creek over there, uh, over the top of a 40-foot obstacle, the houses, again, would have to be 30 or 40 feet tall before there was any visibility from the house to the project or from the project over to the house. So I want to bring that to your, your attention as well. Uh, I also want to talk about drainage. Uh, we are, of course, uh, going to abide by the law as it pertains to drainage and detention for this site. Uh, there's been a, a lot of uh, uh, talk about uh, flooding issues. Certainly they are on everyone's mind with what's going on in Houston, uh, what even happened in Little Rock on, on April the 30th. Uh, this project uh, is, uh, will provide for, as we are required to, uh, by the city, and they are the authority having jurisdiction over this project, we will absolutely uh, abide by their requirements uh, pertaining to drainage uh, and detention storage. As you know, we'll have to do the calculations, we'll have to do the design, we'll have to provide them with documentation uh, to show and, and, and prove that this is what we're going to do, that uh, we're gonna be providing for detention on our site and we are not uh, going to be exacerbating any uh, flooding conditions uh, along the, uh, the, uh, the creek. We have to do this in order to get a building permit. We submit these documents uh, to the city. They give it a very intense review uh, before uh, we can uh, get uh, the building permit. Uh, so anyway, I wanted to uh, just make that, uh, make you aware of that. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Okay, thanks, Brian. Sissy? I'm on a, uh, we got one of our next door neighbors that was, had a concern with the drainage uh, issue, and I want to admit, uh, introduce Sissy Brandon and she wanted, wants to uh, talk to you about that. Chairman Barry, Vice Chairman Bubbles, Planning Commission members. I'm pre I'm, my name is Sissy Brandon, Elizabeth Brandon, and I'm president of Doug Brandon Properties, which owns Pinnacle Valley Shopping Center, a 23,000 square foot retail center located at 14,700 Cantor Road. <coughs> Pinnacle Valley Plaza has a common boundary with the land, which is the subject of the rezoning application we're considering today. Our property has been managed by Coel Banker Hathaway Group for over 10 years, and Jim Hathaway of that firm has provided professional advice to us regarding this application. After learning about the application, we had multiple questions concerning the possible negative impact on our property. In early June, I wrote a letter to Donna James expressing those concerns, which included draining, drainage issues, fencing, landscape screening, and passageway. A few weeks later, the applicant initiated dialogue with me and my advisor, Jim Hathaway. Through that dialogue, the applicant satisfactorily addressed each of our concerns. As a result, Doug Brandon Properties is no longer opposed to this rezoning application. We now believe the proposed development will be of benefit to our tenants. I'm a Farmer Planning Commission member, and I'm very aware of the issues that this body faces on a regular basis. I served with Mr. Barry a few years back. <laughs> Thank you for taking my remarks into consideration. I appreciate you very much. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Ms. Brandon. Okay. I think we're good. Okay. Thank you. We have, we have 33 seconds left. Chris Stewart on behalf of Reese uh, Development and the Hamilton. Uh, appreciate you guys letting us be here today, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and ladies. I would just like to say the great thing about your position is you're an independent body. You are the arbitrator. You're not elected. You do not have constituents. Facts and reason is all that matters. You cannot be capricious and you may not be arbitrary. It is the facts in this case which shall prevail. And, it, and, it, and in this matter, that is all that is in this case. There will always be a NIMBY argument. Always. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sorry, I had two cards who wanted to speak, uh, Gene Eberly and Paul Bouchard, and uh, time was up. So we're going to move on to uh, those who wish to speak against. I want to again remind 
those who did sign cards that we have up over 18 cards and we have 20 minutes so uh, keep that in mind to be expeditious uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of uh, commonality and things are said and if you don't want to speak certainly give up your time uh, so with that in mind let's begin um, Vice Chair, who's, who's up to bat first? We have um, Enos Jones. Good afternoon, Chairman and members of the Commission. Uh, my name is Enos Jones, and I'm going to start from the very beginning. Of when I first, in 2013, I purchased 2.68 acres out there along Isom Creek. And... Uh, the property that he has filled in used to be, I guess, a floodway. It was actually level ground, lower ground. And his attorney said something that was key, and I made a note of it. He said the facts. The number one fact is he did not get a permit to fill that uh, floodway. And foundation is key. Now, in 2015, when I submitted all of my applications for permit before I could put a fork in the ground out there. It had to be approved by the planning commission and everything. And from my understanding, he, he did not get a proper permit to fill that floodway. Uh, I've got some photos of the damage that is being caused by some of the water that's being pushed from the buildup from where he built up that floodway. That post right there was approximately about 20 feet away from the edge of the creek. It's sitting in the creek bank now. That's another post. That's a picture of his, the opposite side. As you can see, there's no erosion on that side of the creek. That's another point on the other opposite side of the creek. If you keep going, that right there is uh, some of the field. This right here is about a two-foot drop on the back part of that property where uh, washout, where I had built up topsoil and field. It's about a two-foot drop from that concrete slab there. The next photo is a lot of what is filled in out there, concrete, blocks, and things of that nature. And the foundation is, is, is something that's important. And if the foundation is crooked and warped, everything that goes up is going to be crooked and warped. And that's, I'm finished with my presentation. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Robert Trammell. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Trammell, and I live in the Pinnacle Valley Court uh, Development, and I'm the Property Owner Association President. Uh, I've been asked to speak to you on behalf of our residents as well as the residents of several other subdivisions in this area. Over the last uh, 20 years or so, the city planners have been very consistent in requiring all residential developments along this corridor or the residential areas to be limited to detached single family structures. This proposed development would be a radical departure uh, from this policy and I think it would undermine the trust that hundreds of property owners have in the city leaders. Uh, our concerns lie in three areas. Uh, number one, roads and traffic signals, and um, I think the engineer covered the traffic signals pretty thoroughly, but the roads, in 2012, the city planners issued a letter that their intent was for Pinnacle Valley Drive, uh, where most of us live, to be allowed to develop so that it could retain its country lane feel. It would be improved and uh, widened to uh, be two-lane road with dual bike lanes. They did not intend for it to become four lanes or to keep it from, uh, and to keep it from becoming a, a main traffic artery. This development would uh, help to undermine, I think, this plan. Number two, infrastructure. The water lines, sewer lines, electrical grid were des designated for suburban development, not high density urban projects. Why not stick with the current policies that were very wisely developed over a lot of years so as to not overwhelm the infrastructure. Sure, go ahead and uh, develop the property, 
but follow the existing guidelines that all the other developers have been made to follow over the last 15 to 20 years. And then thirdly, flooding and drainage issues. And a little bit about what Enos has talked about, but I want to go over some things. All the subdivisions developed that I mentioned previously had strict density limits placed on the developers who that you addressed, uh, I think it's four or five units per acre, who also were required to build retention ponds. And also when you build single family houses, you know, they're proposing, his engineer said they would have about 54 to 55% of it hard surfaces. Uh, our residential areas are just a very few percent, but even in spite of all that, we've had drainage issues out there. Um, and um, let's see, let me find my place. I mentioned previously uh, they had strict density limits placed on the developer who also were required to build retention ponds and to control water runoff after heavy rains. In spite of the city's efforts to limit water runoff, Pinnacle Valley Drive has flooded several times in the last few years and is getting worse as this area has developed. This spring, after a particularly heavy rain, it was underwater for several hours and several erosion, uh, and severe erosion undermined the roadway. Fortunately, uh, the city recently completed um, physical improvements to Pinnacle Valley Drive and they've taken care of most of these issues. But we believe that this high density project and lack of a lot of retentive ponds, they had one small one I think in their plan, uh, and then th there's gonna be more dredging required to build this project will further worsen our flooding problems. Uh, in summary, the city has planned and zoned this area for suburban development. This proposed development is high density urban development. Uh, Mr. Reese himself admitted that uh, his proposed development was being designed to appeal to people attracted to high density urban lifestyles. Urban projects are fine for areas that can accommodate high density traffic, high infrastructure demands, and areas free from flooding issues, but not for this area. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mindy Morrell. Commissioners. I am Mindy Morrell representing the Pleasant Valley Neighborhood Association and um, I could guesstimate it's about 250 acres and we have about 240 households so the quick math is obviously about a household per acre. So I'm sort of reiterating what Don has said about urban de or just density issues and this would put about 25 to 26 households per acre. Um, the other I, I would like to say I think I can safely say that we are not against multifamily residential development. We just don't think that this is the space for it. Um, it is transitional and I'm really, we want you to stick with a low density transitional planning and uh, keep us, keep the master plan, as we all have this on, in force. Thank you so much. Thank you. Kelton Brown, Jr., please. My name is Kelton Brown. I'm a land developer in Little Rock, and I've been out on Highway 10 developing property for 30-something years. Uh, I've seen the flooding. I've done extensive drainage on Highway 10. This project will do nothing more than flood Pinnacle Valley Road. We, they're calling it drive. It's not Pinnacle. Pinnacle Valley Road. Just since the April 30th flood, We've had other floods that came through, and we had stalled cars on Pinnacle Valley Road that couldn't get out. Stalled them out, they had to tow them away. So this will not do any good for Pinnacle Valley Road at all. It will throw water back on Pinnacle Valley Road, and they can't drive through. And since they believe that the Highway 10 widening will be done within five, six years, I worked on Highway 10 widening from the beginning, and it was 35 years ago. Okay, 35 years ago. <laughs> it took years to happen. So if we believe that the highway department is gonna buy more property and widen Highway 10 to, I guess, three lanes each way, in 10 years, don't believe it, it probably won't happen. It will cost a lot of money. So I think it shouldn't happen. Not an not a apartment complex in there. He ought to go out to the ranch 
There, he has friends out the ranch that own property. Be a good location. I'll be all for it. That's my work. Thank you. <clears throat> Sylvia Martin, please. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm Celia Martin. I live on Canterbury Court in Westchester, which is directly off of um, Taylor Loop uh, to the west, just about a block from the intersection. I, too, I'm, actually, I have a house in uh, one of Mr. Uh, Brown's uh, developments. I'm sorry, I've lost my mind here. <laughs> uh, at any rate, I've been a, a part of this project uh, and proposal and all the everything since, 2000, since eight, 1988 is when we purchased our property. We moved out there in 1989 when Taylor Loop Road was literally an asphalt covered lane with grass uh, shoulders on it. Henson Road had not been connected. Rolling Road was on the, you know, on the plans, but it certainly had not been there. Uh, there was a stop sign at Taylor Loop and Highway 10. So you can imagine the development that, that we have seen. When we purchased that property, we were fully aware that development was going to come, come about. We were involved in the zoning of Harvest Foods, which is now an Easter Seal facility, and all of that. And it was during that time that the Highway 10 overlay development design, for, I can't even remember all the words for it, but at any rate, when a gr large group of citizens spent a considerable amount of time trying to determine how they were going to provide for a, a cohesive way to provide can, to provide continued beauty and development all the way out Highway 10 to the west. After all, that's one of the most beautiful areas that you can exit the city from. I used to think, oh boy, when I got to just below where uh, Walton Heights comes in and you go around that curve and you just felt yourself go, ah, it's peaceful. Well, I assure you it's not peaceful now. <laughs> but uh, I passed out to you what uh, the DOD is for Highway 10 says, and one of the purposes of it was to provide a transition from the heavy traffic and, and heavy development into a more, uh, more of a suburban area. And I hope that you will continue to Think about that as you make decisions on developments that are this dense. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Keith Wingfield, please. Good afternoon, uh, members of the commission and Chairman Barry, Vice Chairman Bubbas. My name is Keith Wingfield. I am the managing member of Ison Creek Development, LLC, and we are the developers of the newly opened uh, village at Ison Creek. We started our first houses a couple weeks ago. We are immediately due west of this proposed development, and we have a contiguous property line. Our eastern line is the western line of Mr. Reese's development. Um, I'm not normally here speaking against development, that's very unusual for me, and, and it's a little bit difficult for me to do that. But uh, I'm in here today in opposition to approval of these apartments, primarily because this is the wrong place. This is simply the wrong place. This land is at least almost half of it zoned for single-family R2 homes. And in fact, I had the four and a half acres that he has in this project under contract to actually join to our subdivision. So any thought that it could not be developed into R2 property uh, is not true. What happened is 
my uh, offer expired and I didn't have all my FEMA floodway ducks in a row yet because we didn't know if we were going to be able to get that approval and we have subsequently uh, received that approval and if you haven't driven out there you need to see the size of what you have to develop and the length of the bridge that we built over Ison Creek is 110 millennial feet long and a very very wide uh, stream bed now to protect against the flooding so that property can be developed in, in R2 and it's it, this is not an urban area. This is not an urban area that would, should ever be, and I, I know I'm repeating this a little bit, but the Highway 10 corridor was, was developed so this would maintain a suburban feel. And a four-story apartment building in this location is, is not suburban at all. I want to tell you that in the land use plan, if, if it maintained the traffic uh, of a single-family subdivision, then that's about 10 trips a day per home. And if we had developed it, we would have built on this four and a half acre track uh, about 16 homes. And at 16 homes at 10 trips a day, that's 160 trips per day. Now you compare that to lesser trips for multifamily, seven trips per day, but on this same four and a half acres, he would build 96 apartments. And that's 672 trips per day. So that is more than four times the number of trips that this land is zoned for. And I think you need to consider that. I drive this area all the time. And I don't know how, what the accident issues are out there right now, but that intersection at Taylor Loop is one that's just waiting for a fatality because it is dangerous. I think you need to stick to the scenic corridor plan. This, the, it, it hasn't worked perfectly, but it's worked pretty well. We do have the commercial clusters, but behind those commercial clusters, you need the support of housing. And uh, there are many zoned areas for multifamily on, in this corridor. And I, I'm, I'm sure it will be a very fine development. I'm, I'm not questioning that at all. But I would tell you that it's not the right place and needs to pick it up and take it and put it somewhere else. This is simply a classic case of upzoning. Bought a piece of property, zoned residential. And you know, you can buy a property that's zoned residential pretty inexpensively. And then you can take it and you convert it to something else, and it should bring a higher dollar value. And I'm telling you that the the, the plan is well thought out, it's purposeful, and it protects all these hundreds of single family homeowners all around Highway 10, including the 48 that we plan to have in their homes here in a, a very short period of time. The last thing I want to say is about the floodway. I had the um, I have the privilege of having a son that is a civil engineer, and he is what I consider to be a very bright individual, and he got to do my uh, floodway analysis. And he's since now taken a lot of coursework to become what I think is an expert on it. So, and he lets me know that he's an expert and how dumb I am about it. But uh, what I have done by listening to him is understand how floodways work. There is very little room between the northern side of Mr. Reese's property uh, and Pinnacle Valley Road to construct the type of floodway improvements without encroaching on either Mr. Ennis's property or taking up a sizable portion of the planned property. Now, they talk about following the rules, but I can tell you right now that that hasn't happened on that piece. and and. I think they've told us that there's been some illegal dumping out there where people have come in there and dumped concrete blocks and, and bricks and, and things like that, and I, and I understand that. But I've got photos here from the Paget system that shows the parking area behind Senor Tequila is actually built in the floodway. So I'll pass those out.
Now that may not have happened during the time of Senor Tequila because that floodway, guess what? They, they, they modify those maps all the time and it's gotten larger since the, the time uh, back in 2005 or so. There's a new 2015 and it keeps getting larger and larger. So it's a serious issue and it's already causing flooding on Pinnacle Valley Road. So I just don't think this is a gr good development for this particular site. I'm sure it would be good somewhere else, but with that, I'll answer any questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Chris Stewart. <laughs> no, no. Uh, Nick Alsop. My name's Nick Alsip, and I'm actually the president of the Pinnacle Valley Neighborhood Association that Mindy Morell was um, representing before you. And I just wanted to state that um, of the 240 houses that live in that area, none of them have an interest in seeing a, an apartment, um, four-story apartment, developed in this area, and we would appreciate seeing it developed in other areas in the city. Uh, there are many other places where this would be appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ken Harrison. I'll yield my time to say your recognition. Okay, thank you. Richard Stoker. I yield my time. Barbara Lee. I yield my time. Mac Faulkner. I yield my time. Okay. Esmeralda Rodriguez. Kathleen Olson. Kathleen Olson, representing the League of Women Voters of Pulaski County. And this, this evening, there were a number of people that talked about the plans and how it was developed. I was on the planning commission also, served for six years <laughs> at one time with Craig. And over and over again, we would have people, as you all do, come to you and say, I bought a house, I looked at the plans, I learned what was around it, I still bought my house. Then they find out that somebody buys some property and they want to do something different than what they thought was going to be happening. You have got to enforce the trust that people should have in the planning of this city. And I would urge you for all the reasons that were discussed to please deny this request. Thank you. Thank you all for those comments. Uh, now we're uh, going to open up uh, for commissioners to have questions and comments. So with that, commissioners. Mr. Bobas. Yes, I have a few questions for staff, um, probably engineering type questions. So if you're all ready, but um, I'd like to talk about the, the flood issue, the washout issue, um, some of these water flow issues. These to me are extremely critical issues that um, if they cause damage to other property owners that are nearby that are critical so I'd like to hear your comments on that is it ha have the plans properly um, accounted for the water flow he is providing the required stormwater detention systems uh, they're located adjacent to the floodway on the northeastern part of the site as a detention area, and there's a second discharge point over to the far western side of the site. Um, both discharge points are directly into Isom Creek, so it's not into somebody's backyard or another conveyance going through somebody's property other than it's going right into the creek. Uh, there, there was, I heard some folks speak that there was a very, very significant storm event in April this year. Uh, we'd estimate in some parts of town, including this part of town, it was around a 50-year storm based on gauge data from the wastewater utility and uh, intensities that we uh, occurred. So, so there was a significant uh, storm. I, I, didn't, I can't speak to uh, uh, flooding on Pinnacle Road. I, I don't, that could have happened. A lot of our streets went underwater for a brief time during that storm event. Is it your opinion that this development will negatively impact 
the flooding in the area or the det detention pond appropriate for that issue? We don't have a final design, but we've been assured that their stormwater system will meet the ordinance. So they are they intend in every way to meet the city standard. Our objection really has been about uh, the number of units and the traffic and the access through the uh, shopping center from public works perspective. Okay. Okay, I'll move on to my questions related to, to um, some of the traffic issues. Um, there, uh, Mr. Peters has suggested that during the peak hours of traffic, which is obviously most critical, that we have a impact of 20 cars during a.m. rush hour and 30 cars during the p.m. rush hour. Are, are those numbers accurate or do you disagree with his analysis? Um, I think the main uh, disagreement, disagreement between us and uh, Arnie is basically the trip distribution. Um, according to Arnie's trip distribution, you have a 50-50 split from the new development Basically, 50% going left towards the city, towards downtown area, 50 going away, or you know, to the west. And I can't definitely tell where they're going. <clears throat> you know, trip distribution is kind of a judgment. You guys can also estimate is 50%, you know, or 50% of the traffic going towards town and 50 going away towards the West Little Rock area. We think that probably 60 to 70 percent are probably going to come towards the town. So when you change the trip, trip distribution numbers, you can, you know, adjust the traffic numbers. So in your opinion, so he's estimating 20 cars during the a.m. rush hour. So if that were, you're saying it should, instead of being 50-50, it should have been, say, 75 percent. So that would be maybe 30 to 40 cars during? That would be reasonable. Um, also, the other thing is, uh, uh, Arnie said that, you know, our numbers are old. And if I look at his study, actually, we showed westbound left turns during AM of 375 and is, you know, is 355. So 375 versus 355. Is that for the... What period of time was that for? Because I, I thought I, I wrote down in my notes for 20. The for the morning. For the uh, whole morning or during no, rush hour? I'm talking about the westbound left turns only. The, the traffic coming from the development, <clears throat> you have a total of 87 left turns during the AM peak hour. 87 left turns yes. during the AM peak hour coming from the apartments? Yes, these are Arnie's numbers with the existing traffic and added, you know, projected traffic. So 87 vehicles during the a.m. peak hour and during the evening peak hour? Evening, uh, they're showing 70, this morning, 78. This 20 and 30, but. 78. I'm, 78. Mm -hmm. And if you note, you know, they also have 84 right turns in the a.m. peak hour, 76 right turns during. You're saying about another half of those right turns could have been left turns. That's my. That's your opinion, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, okay, so you're thinking it could be as upwards of 140 left turns, something like that. Just yeah, throwing the, the numbers around. Yeah, the problem is uh, with traffic, it's not like you know weighing something. You get exact measurement. You have to use your judgment, and that's where we disagree. Um, I'm not saying that Arnie's wrong. I'm not saying that I'm right, but based on the the general, you know, trips, the patterns, most of the traffic is going to probably turn left. That, I, you can I, use I, I would agree with that. That seems logical. Exactly. Um, is it okay if we hear Ernie's response? Yes. Okay. I'd like to, we need to really know what's, what we're voting on here as far as traffic. Thank you, uh, Vice Chairman Bubbis. Uh, just to offer a little bit of clarification, the, the 20 and the 30 vehicles that I referenced uh, earlier were an increase compared to the single family and uh, PCD development versus what is being proposed. That, that did not okay, represent the, the total traffic. Let me comment a little bit further about the directional distribution, and Mr. Benahati is correct that that matters. Uh, and he's also correct that 
uh, it's a judgment call what direction those vehicles might come and go. With uh, all the additional school traffic out to the west and the home to, to school trips, home to work trips, uh, what we base the 50-50 more or less percent uh, distribution, the left turns versus the right turns on, was what the existing traffic patterns are out there. Okay. And surprisingly, it's almost a 50-50 split in the AMP taking kids tower, to school or something. eastbound versus westbound. The other thing I'd like to point out is that <clears throat> that really doesn't matter a whole lot because of the signal phasing that the city has. They have split phasing there where all of the northbound goes at one time, it stops, all of the southbound goes at a different time. So except for those vehicles that might be coming out of the Walgreens area or out of this development area and turning right and could do so in a gap in the traffic, the, the timing that is allowed for the north side would all be allocated to whatever the vehicle movement is, whether it's left turn, right turn, or straight through. Uh, so what direction they turn, uh, except for those that can left, turn right freely, freely as long as they're coming south. Uh, don't, don't matter. Right. Uh, so if there's further question on traffic that I can answer, uh, I'd be glad to. I have a question for staff on that. So he's, he's estimating that as an increase over single family residential, as he estimates 20, in the a.m. peak hour and 30 in the p.m. peak hour over single-family residential. Um, if what I'm hearing, if the, I guess the, the way they turn is different from that ratio, it might could be 30 to 45. Do you agree with his analysis on that? Is that yes. in the correct ballpark? Yeah, it depends on how we, dist you know, uh, allot the distribution. But so, just to be clear, that would be an increase over single-family residential yes. somewhere in the range of 30 cars in the morning or less, 20 to 40, say, and in the p.m. hour, somewhere around 45 in that range, yes. in, in increase. Okay, so we're looking at a, about a car every uh, two minutes there for 30 cars in the morning. Okay. Um, I think I'll let, let some other commissioners ask a few questions. Okay, sure thing. Commissioner Cox. Yes, uh, actually, I you know, I've commented about the traffic through this area before. Certainly, uh, it is a problem, particularly on the, uh, over, I've always said before, the overlap of the turning into the shopping centers and Jury Drive. I've always referenced that before. And I, I do live in, I've traveled this every day myself, living, I live uh, off uh, Henson's, so very familiar with this area and dealing with the traffic there. So it is a very considerable problem. There is no doubt about that. That being said, I will say, uh, Back in April, uh, March and April, this commission and subsequently the board had approved a development out at the ranch, which uh, when you speak of traffic, there was a development for the Bank of the Ozarks that's going to include their headquarters, a conference center, a hotel, restaurant, uh, two different retail office buildings, three levels each, an office building, three level, and two office buildings that are four levels. And that planned development uh, is going to have approximately 718,000 square feet with allocated parking spaces of 1,525 spaces compared to the 442 spaces here or three and a half times as much. So actually that development itself, not to say that we're not, you know, this commission all approved that development, but that development, that's going to cause the traffic not this one. Traffic's coming regardless. So it's not this that's causing the traffic. Traffic's going to be going because the, the new development's coming to the ranch. And um, so I think that, you know, the focus is not what this is going to do, is more of what's going to be occurring, you know, 1.9 miles further out to the west. Uh, and then obviously you're going to have more ensuing development as we know continue going out west because in Little Rock, the only area of development that we have available is going to the west where landlocked obviously um, can go north uh, to the east we're pretty well as far as we can go there we're near the south borders uh, doing much of pretty much is going to the west as the area of growth uh, long term in the city which obviously I've you know we have witnessed that over the last uh, 20 25 years that's been occurring so you know, I think, you know, you look at all the different issues, certainly the traffic is the focus, but um, I think the traffic alone on this site should not 
preclude its development because further development to the west is where the traffic is going to be generated. Um, certainly there is other roads, alternatives, trying to look at where do we turn off, you know, people going up and down Rawling. Rawling's been improved, you know, in the last few years. Uh, certainly Schnall Parkway, more people using that as well. So, you know, people, instead of turning east, going on Cantor, they may be going up Rawling, they may be going further out to La Marche or going up the parkway. Um, you know, so I look at this, the traffic at this point is not going to be the generator as much as that previous development that was approved. But that being said, I, I support this project. I think, as uh, Mr. Elliott pointed out, I think it's, it is good growth that, um, for development of the city that does support the infill within the city as well as does support our public school system as well. So I would certainly urge support of this project. Thank you, Commissioner Cox. Other commissioners? Commissioner May. Let's get back to why we're here, whether we're on building department. <laughs> I'll defer that traffic's on the increase. That's Markham and the University 20 years from now, whether this gets built or not. And I can't tell you how many times I voted against apartment complexes on Bowman Road. I told Mr. Reese, I said, I think I misled him first on because I said, I'm the happiest thing guy in Little Rock to think on the planning commission. I'm not going to have to vote against another apartment complex on Bowman Road with their 2,000 or however many there are out there. But uh, unlike my friend Mr. Keith over there, this is the wrong place for this thing. Uh, let's not get too many apartments and start there. There's land to the west where this ought to go, and I'm like Mr. Wingfield. I ain't real smart, but traffic's going to go up whether this thing is built or not. But uh, this don't hurry it along. Thank you, Commissioner May. Commissioner Leahy, can you get it? Yeah, I, got, I hit the button that time. <laughs> Along about the time Ms. Martin purchased her property out there in, in Westchester is the time they started a strip mall there across from Westchester and on Highway 10. Now, I remember being hired by the people that were in that strip mall to develop that land past them, which is where uh, this project is now, into a parking lot. And they still had the water and uh, all that kind of stuff. And I don't know exactly what happened, why it got derailed and it didn't develop it. But I'm sure that some of those people out there hadn't have been opposed to a parking lot, that they'd have a parking lot in there now and you wouldn't be worrying about this. Now, on the traffic, I don't worry about traffic, but most of those people that's going to be occupying this apartment complex won't even have cars. And I know people in this part of the world, are, uh, it's hard to believe that they don't have cars. But I used to go into Washington, D.C., and that part of the world up there quite often and stay a week or two weeks or three weeks at a time. And there's a lot of people that do, do not have cars. They, they walk. Okay. And, wow. and they walk everywhere they go. We had a group of them in Little Rock come down for a convention, and they wanted to know where they could go eat breakfast besides us down at the market. And I said, well, there's a Wendy's about nine blocks away, and a little lady there like to have passed out thinking okay. those long, young girls would walk nine blocks. Okay. That girl uh, said, we don't even have a car. Commissioner, can we kind of okay. get some direction here? All right, but I'm trying to t what I'm trying to say is that I don't think that traffic is going to be a big a big problem because that uh, those people are not going to have cars; they're going to walk, and that okay. Uh, okay, okay. And if if, if people have been opposed to it, when you your subdivisions built out there, would you be out there now? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Commissioner Lahey. Other commissioners. We, we are a citizens uh, commission too, so uh, we reflect different perspectives. 
Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back to the traffic. I'm glad you're still up here, so I'm gonna beat this horse to death. I appreciate you guys' patience, but I wanna know all the facts. I think you guys need or deserve that. So um, when you said, when we did that range of additional vehicles, was that for the whole 10 acres being single family residential? Or was that with, because half of it's single family, the other half could be commercial. So was your analysis with the whole site as single family? If that's, if that's correct, that analysis might be. That, that difference is the net difference between if the property were to develop a combination of single family and PCD for the entire 11 acres as it's currently zoned versus as it's being proposed as multifamily. Okay. So half of it as residential and then the other half as PCD. R roughly half. Okay. Yes. Um, Apartments are always, always difficult, and um, nobody wants them next door. And I'll, I'll just walk you through kind of my analysis when I look at these issues. Um, one of the first things I look for is negative or adverse impacts. That's why we've been talking about flood a lot. And uh, if I could get a little help from Walter, if you could um, go to the slide that the applicant presented, the final Hamilton, and then I want to come back to this one. Um, the final Hamilton presentation, but there on, on this one, you can, you can see, uh, the buffer. If you'll flip through that to the aerial, um, I think it kind of shows the buffer a little bit better right there. Back one. Perfect. Okay. So if, if you'll, if you can look at this drawing here, I think it shows what I like to see on, on buffer. So there to the North, we have a, a large amount of buffer and green space, basically caused by the creek and the flood area there and we have got one home there that's impacted to the north and possibly i guess one there we can see on the other one uh to the west i'm i'm sure we're going to have how many homes mr wingfield built on how many right there just adjacent to the property line do you do you propose you think 20. well that one street adjacent to it will have 20 houses around it okay so we're looking at around maybe 22 to in less than 25 homes that are immediately impacted with that buffer. Um, so th that's one of the factors that I'd, I like to look at is how many homes are going to be touched, how many homes are going to be impacted. In this case, we've seen a lot where there is an entire residential area surrounding the multifamily project. Um, we don't see that here. On the south side, we have commercial property that the owners of that are in favor of this development. So this is one of the critical issues because again, almost every multifamily deal that we look at, um, people don't like them, the neighbors don't like them. So the immediate impact to this compared to some of the other ones is minimal is what I would say, suggest. Um, one of the other factors I, I like to look at, um, again, is traffic. We've, we've talked about that quite a bit. I think with part of this potentially being developed as, as office, In, yes, ma'am. But alternatively, and if, if you can, thank you, thanks. Alternatively, some of the other proposals have been office warehouse for some of the PCD portion of this property. Um, residential, obviously, there to the west. So uh, some of the traffic, the density issues there with office or other retail developments that could happen in that PCD could potentially be greater traffic um, issues there and another thing with traffic I think we need to look at here if we're going to have traffic we want it at a light and I, I know that having a light having traffic at an intersection like this one is a problem but I would rather have traffic at an intersection than have it where they're just pulling out um, those are where we have a lot of accidents so having traffic at an intersection is preferable to having it where there's not an intersection so and I, I believe that the, with, with the staff and the experts here saying that the impact on traffic is going to be around 20 to 30 cars additionally in the AM and, uh, you know, around 40 in the PM, I don't think that is enough to prevent this application from moving forward. Uh, I will also say that if we don't approve residential property in this city, they're going to live elsewhere. 
They're going to go and live in Maumelle. They're going to go live in Bryant. And then they're going to spend their money in Bryant. All of those tax dollars are going to go to other cities. When they go shopping, they don't You shop at Kroger down the street, and all of those tax dollars will come to Little Rock. And um, for those reasons, I'm going to be supporting this. I do sympathize with the community, and I understand this was a very hard one for me. Went back and forth on these issues and wanted to make sure we had the facts. So I apologize if we've upset you tonight. We do appreciate your time. Mr. Penny. Um, Commissioner Bubbas uh, actually went over a lot of the things that, that was on my mind, but I have to say, uh, while I really, really um, think that this is, is an attractive development and I know that multifamily is, is necessary, I can't just uh, forget the neighborhoods. And I think that we need to consider that. I think that um, people... Um, that their property, that they could be affected by this, that the new development that's going in can be affected by this. And I'm a residential realtor and I cannot, um, I cannot uh, look over that. So um, John, I appreciate what you're trying to do and, and I hope you can get it done, but I will have to vote against this. Now the commissioners, uh, Mr. Hamilton. Just so we can kind of revisit the traffic patterns, th there was a slide I think that actually shows uh, the, the entry points and exit points of the property. Could, could we go back to that <clears throat> to look at that Cause I, just so that folks can see how that traffic pattern looks? I think there was own slide. It was a slide just before the one that you looked at, Alan. I think that's it. <coughs> okay. It is kind of, yeah. Yeah, we're good. So, uh, in, in, uh, Commissioner Leahy, I'll have to disagree with you. I think that each adult in uh, this facility probably will have a car. So I don't, I don't think we've got a scenario here where folks are going to be walking. But, so, I mean, so there's no question that the traffic is going to be impacted. I, I, this is a tough one for me. This is a struggle because uh, from a, um, uh, a living standpoint, you know, people want to live where people want to live. And there's no question this is an area of town that people want to live. Uh, the amenities are certainly there. Um, access to schools, you know, the reasons that people pick this area is why people live here. So, so I applaud the uh, development that's being designed here because I think everyone should have an opportunity to live in areas of our city. I also agree that, you know, from a tax base that we do have to continue to find ways to keep people in this city. Um, but I do struggle certainly with the uh, residents that are currently there. I think that we have to look at, um, you know, the impact to those that are there, those that are coming in. So I'm, I'm struggling with this. I haven't decided which way I'm going to vote this evening. I, I, I can see benefits both ways. But again, I just wanted to make sure it's very clear, you know, how the traffic patterns are there, because that is of concern. Certainly the uh, amount of traffic that's going to be in that area. It sounds like all of the other issues from um, staff have been met. Um, but again, I think this is one that we've really got to consider and, and it's going to continue to come to us. Mr. Latour, I call a question. <laughs> I had some comments too, you know. <laughs> And, and and I won't move for the, the, the call the question until I make some comments. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everyone had their chance. Would you like to say something though before we call the question? I agree. We need to come to a close. Uh, and uh, for the sake of time, uh, I, I do want to say something uh, before that. And Walter, go ahead and pull this up uh, because, as, as, as Commissioner May says, this this. This application really needs to turn on the merits of this site application and nothing else. However, what I what I hear and we continue to hear with these very unhappy battles 
out here is is a narrative which I think is very incomplete for our current situation. And um, and what I hear is we have a Highway 10 corridor plan. We need to stick to it. Uh, we're entrusted uh, to do that. Although we uh, city planners were entrusted to do some other things, which I will comment on. This Highway 10 corridor plan, which was a good plan, the design standards are still very valid. The land use uh, prescribed in it are dated. And uh, this quarter plan, I believe, uh, was done in the 1980s. And, you know, the, I'm, I'm starting a conversation heart to heart because I don't think the leadership in City Hall really wants to own this. But the Highway 10 quarter plan, in terms of land uses, is problematic now. And it's uh, 30 years old. The design standards are great. Uh, but there's a, there's there's a larger narrative going on, I think, because we have to meet the citizens, the needs of all citizens, current and future. And and I'm not seeing any millennials here talking uh, against this application. And uh, the 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 time for excuse me, I like to speak, please. Uh, we are past the era having universally low-density residential suburban sanctuaries. Uh, next slide, please. The, the current reality of city building decisions is, is not the one on the left, it's the one on the right. I've, I'm certainly nostalgic. Uh, I wish everyone worked downtown like I did and do, and everyone lived within three miles of the downtown, which I do. But the one on the right is the one where we have now multiple business districts surrounding a city because suburbs have been built and now business districts are building around them. Next slide. Uh, so we have a disconnect and I really, at some point, it's not going to happen here. These are hard truths to ponder, uh, but I think it's some things we need to start talking about. And uh, we hear your voices and we care, but there are voices who aren't here that we care about too. Uh, who need housing. Housing is also one of our charges we're entrusted with and just want to remind those who, who say that we are, are not um, uh, uh, minding our trust, that's part of the story. So things have changed, as, as this slide says. Uh, uh, patterns have changed, economic forces have changed, uh, the needs of our residents have changed, as I will show uh, land use norms are really going to have to change. Our expectations need to be discussed about what's what's important and realistic. Next slide. Uh, the housing supply chain's disrupted. That's is not new to you. Uh, post Great Recession, 2007 and 8, we are now in a period we have, we don't have a mobile population. People want to retire in place. They're holding on to their homes. Uh, the home ownership rates have uh, leveled off and drop and they'll never return to the pre-recession uh, levels. Uh, millennials can less afford traditional homes. Uh, housing starts are anemic, uh, though I'm very pleased with the plats for subdivisions we have been approving lately, and, and, and I, I think that's, I want Becky to have some business uh, out there. Uh, but the large tracts of restricted R2 that we see spray painted out there, which were done years and years ago, really are, are uh, don't, are misaligned to the needs of our future citizens. Next slides. Uh, these are just slides. These are national data, but our local data that mirrors this. You're looking at a shrinking number of uh, retirees who are going to stay in place. They're not going to uh, open up their housing. Next slide. Home inventory is shrunk. Uh, we want to get single family homes back uh, in the building phase, but let, let's face it, it's not going to go. Uh, Home construction is not going to come back to pre-recession levels. Next slide. Uh, housing is expensive. That's why we're seeing more rental apartment investment and constructions. Next slide. Uh, starter homes. This, you know, this ones we talk about the millennials who aren't present here tonight to speak of their concerns. Uh, it's difficult to afford the homes these days for a lot of different reasons. Uh, next slide. Here's one, this slide I use a lot. This is, this is the housing starts, home construction Little Rock. I get this from Metro Plan. Um, it's like a, a flat line. I want to build more single family homes, but they're not coming. 
and, and until they come back, we do have to provide housing. Uh, next slide. Rental rates are going up. Uh, we are, we have uh, more than 45% of households in Little Rock are renters. So that's hard to disregard that. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is just the uh, apartment uh, capacity slide. I would like to say, you know, I keep thinking craft beers, sales, and brew pubs are reaching capacity, and, and they never do <laughs> as far as a um, number of players in the market. And I, I thought apartment uh, capacity had, had reached its peak a year or two ago, but uh, there's still demand. Next slide. Here's one I really want you to look at. The bottom three colors are of uh, younger generations starting in 2005 they're being squeezed out of the market these are percent of owner occupied housing and um, even the above Millennials near baby boomers uh, are being squeezed out of the market uh, in terms of home ownership there isn't any for a lot of different reasons and the median age fortunately for our population is still quite young it has an increase so we're not an aging population next slide Here's one that really gets me. Look at this. The red bars represent uh, Pulaski County for persons aged 25 to 34. This is the, the mortgage cost as a percent of their household income. Look how much higher that is in, in the, the national average for those years, and it's getting worse. It's getting a lot worse. Next slide. Here's the big one. I like to show this a lot, and everyone on the commission will have to... Uh, Forgive me for being so redundant, but this, this shows that we're not a single business district downtown anymore. We have multiple commercial business districts all over town. Highway 10, we've got them out Can Canish Chenal, and now it's moving out uh, south, Colonel Glen, uh, where you see the, uh, uh, the outlet mall. People, people like to live near where they either work or they're getting services. And this is not just people in single-family homes, but you know those that service people who live out there in single-family homes are bankers. They're people who work in banks. They're people who work in restaurants, and uh, you know that I hate to send a message to those that they're not welcome to live places where they're they're uh, working. Next slide, and this is the one. You know, this is the hard truth, but uh, we are agents of our own change and undesirable changes that follow us. And rooftops are followed by commercial investments and multifamily housing. Uh, uh, this is part of this. this is, we need, we're all part of this conversation. We move out of the city um, to flee certain things, but the city follows us, and we have to come to that recognition. However, uh, that being said, this is just a narrative, a conversation. The Highway 10 quarter plan is something I think we need to rethink. Uh, that, that's a policy decision for the city board. Uh, the land uses, the ones that are questioned, the design standards are fine. Um, but the decision we now will come to, now that the question has been called, is, is, is this a good site application for this particular land use? And with that, um, I'll accept a motion. Uh, thank you for your analysis. I just want to remind you all this is a volunteer Commission. <laughs> so all of that work, it's because he cares and he's a good guy. But um, I move for approval of item A with all staff recommendations and comments except that of denial. Okay. I'll second. Okay. We have we have a move, uh, a motion made, and been seconded to approve the application as filed with staff recommendations. If you're for the application, please raise your hand. Let me count one, two. If you're against the application, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five. So it's split. Uh, so the motion fails. The application uh, is denied for lack of uh, six affirmative votes. So. I do. I do want to appreciate y'all's patience tonight. I know this is a difficult issue, and you, this is the second time you've come, and we're all people of good faith. And what's that? Third time. Uh, okay. <laughs> We have gotten you out before six. Uh, tailgate parties are still <laughs> abounding. So uh, thank you, and we'll move on with the regular agenda.
Hey, while we're transitioning, I had some cards on uh, item D that was deferred. I want to be sure these uh, people were not out here waiting for their item to be called because it was deferred. It was. Um, They're the same it, folks that were here on Hamilton. What's that? They're the same folks that were here on Hamilton. Okay. So it was Celia Martin, Mac Faulkner, Bill Morrison. That item's been deferred. Just want to be sure. Thank you. Fellow commissioners, let's uh, put out our cigarettes and reconvene. We got a couple more commissioners and. Um, and the next item, by the way, will be item B uh, regarding the LaMarche uh, application. And if you have not filled out a card for that and wish to speak, please do so. It doesn't obligate you to speak, but it certainly gives you an opportunity. But the, the, the same um, uh, rules apply. I don't have as many cards for this as I did the previous application. One, two, three, four. I got about eight or nine in opposition. So we will, the, the 20 minute uh, rule will apply. Um, so be as effective and expeditious as you can. Uh, I want people to have a voice, uh, but uh, I think we will. Uh, most of you will have a chance to speak. Missing uh, one commissioner. That's Commissioner Bubbas. He's quick. He can catch up. Okay. All right. Then, staff, please. <laughs> Item B, file number S-867-J, eight times. Chennau Valley, phase 30 and 31 preliminary plat, located east of Lamarche Drive between Lamarche Drive and Rolling Road. On August 18, 2005, the Little Rock Planning Commission approved a preliminary plat request for the site to allow the subdivision of a 115-acre tract into 227 single-family residential lots averaging 85 feet by 135 feet or 11,475 square feet in area. The applicant indicated a density of 1.97 units per acre, consistent with the development pattern in the area. The applicant indicated the development would be constructed in three phases. That development did not occur. The current request is to allow the subdivision of 116 acres um, with 246 single-family residential mm -hmm. lots. The development is indicated in multiple phases occurring over eight phases. The lots are indicated with an average lot size of 80 by 130. The plat indicates 25-foot front and rear building setbacks and standard side yard setbacks. The plat includes several tracts of open space. The areas of open space will be maintained by the Property Owners Association as common green spaces. The plat indicates the construction of an emergency access from Rolling Road to serve the new development and comply with the uh, request of the fire department. 
the applicant is seeking approval of alternative pedestrian paths in lieu of sidewalks. The subdivision ordinance states, states that pedestrian paths can be uh, can replace sidewalks if approved by the Planning Commission. The applicant is requesting several variances from Chapter 29 of the City Code as part of the application. The applicant is requesting a variance to advance grade phase 31-2 through 31-5 with the issuance of a grading permit for 31-1 due to the applicant's desire to balance the cut and fill on the site. Staff recommends approval of this variance subject to the preliminary grading and drainage plan being developed for phases 31-2 through 31-5 prior to the issuance of a grading permit for 31-1. Secondly, the applicant is requesting a variance for slopes the south side of the lots in phase 31-3 to grade to a 2-to-1 slope, which exceeds the maximum 3-to-1 slope due to the existing angles of the shale plane. Staff recommends approval of the variance for this 2-to-1 slope. Lastly, the applicant is requesting to exceed the maximum water surface storage elevation in the stormwater detention pond of 4 feet due to the applicant's desire to construct detention ponds which can uh, drain stormwater beyond the minimum requirements and to make modifications to the drainage discharge location within the subdivisions to balance the discharge flow from the site to possibly improve some of the existing downstream flooding issues. Staff recommends approval of the variance due to the belief that this will lessen some of the historical downstream flooding. Um, the item was deferred from your previous public hearing based on staff's concerns with site distance at the, the uh, intersecting street of Eberron Drive and LaMarche. Um, Public Works recommendation is the intersection of Everyone Drive and LaMarche Drive does not provide adequate intersection site distance. The intersection shall be modified to provide safe access to Chennault Valley Phase 30 and 31 subdivision and the traveling public on LaMarche Drive in the method approved by the Public Works Department. No permits, including advanced grading permits for construction of the subdivision, will be issued by staff until the intersection design is approved. And the letter from the applicant, uh, Deltic, notes that um, Deltic Timber Corporation with their engineer White Daters and Associates will work with staff to design a safe intersection which Public Works staff will support. And I think that's all I need to put in there on that. Okay. So with that, staff recommends approval of the request subject to compliance with the comments and conditions as outlined in paragraphs D, E, and F of the agenda staff report. Staff recommends approval of the variance request from the city's land alteration ordinance to allow grading of future phases with the development of the first phase. Staff recommends approval of the variance request to allow the two-to-one slope. Staff recommends approval of the variance request to allow the detention pond to exceed the maximum water surface storage elevation for the stormwater detention pond. And I think Mr. Daters and Mr. Spivey probably have some additional comments that they want to add to this based on agreements and, and conversations with the neighborhood. Thank you, staff. The applicant, uh, please approach the lectern, please. Did you want to make a presentation or wait to hear concerns or do both? And well, um, I was going to do that. Okay. Um, Great. So if I can kind of start again, I'll go back. Yeah. Chairman Barry, mm -hmm. Commissioner, Director Collins, Ms. James, Mr. Overton, kind of hand down, and on a different level, my friend Mr. Carney. Rather than engage in the usual rhetorical side trips that I sometimes do, which are often entertaining and more often not. The hour is growing late, and I'm going to immediately defer to Mr. Daters, who, as Ms. James has uh, foreshadowed and suggested, uh, is, has the meat of the matter in hand. And let me first uh, also compliment the folks um, in Madison Valley who have been very receptive, open, uh, and worked with Deltic over the past several weeks to get to where we are tonight. So let me defer to Mr. Daters. I'll reserve any comments that I have, if any, for rebuttal. Thank you. Chairman Barry, Commissioner, staff. Um, my name is Tim Daters. I'm an engineer with White Daters and Associates. Uh, we have been busy over since we were deferred the last time. On several occasions, we've met with some of the residents and had telephone conversations uh, from Madison Valley. Uh, the changes that we've made in the in the plat, and we've made several changes in the plat itself to uh, clarify things and help people understand items on the plat. Uh, adjacent to Madison Valley, uh, we had originally proposed to leave a 25-foot undisturbed buffer. Uh, we've looked at our plans and, 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 and voicing their concerns, 
And so we were, we were able to increase that undisturbed buffer to 50 feet over about half of the distance. And uh, over on the eastern portion where we cannot get to that width, we've agreed that in the area that's within 50 feet of their subdivision that we do have to disturb, that we'll come back in and plant dense evergreen screening uh, to assist in reestablishing that screen in the areas that we cannot do it. Uh, we did develop in conjunction with Madison Valley, and, and again, they're, 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 they're here so they'll be able to speak also, but they were very, uh, I said we had productive meetings. Uh, we, uh, I think, uh, their means helped us to understand the issues that, that they face, and they also learned a little bit about what the issues that we face as we develop property. But uh, Donna. In, in terms of, I'll just, these are the additions that we've agreed to make a condition of this preliminary plat approval. Uh, we originally had a, a set of about um, nine conditions that we had agreed to, and uh, after further review, uh, Ms. Delsa sent me a, a note today that I responded again in, in yellow that yes, we can do this, or no, we can't do this one. And so we have been communicating back and forth, and, and all the commitments that we make on these, we want to make part of the record, and we'll agree to do as part of this plat. Uh, the main issues that we that we got into immediately were some storm drainage issues that Storm uh, Madison Valley was experiencing. Uh, we have committed to not increase any of the stormwater discharges coming from this development into Madison Valley. Uh, we've further committed to work with Public Works in Madison Valley and to keep them informed and be part of the process. Uh, we hope that public, during the submittal process, we hope to keep them informed, to address their questions, and as we go forward to. Uh, uh, keep them a part of the design process. Uh, we have also, um, we've agreed that during the construction of the subdivisions that we will keep the construction traffic uh, during the advanced grading and the development of the streets and utilities that we'll keep it off of Tater Loop Road, that the, the site will be accessed uh, from La Marche and, and traffic will not go up and down Tater Loop Road. And that's a pretty easy thing to agree on because the city's Taylor Loop Road project is about getting ready to start and once that starts nobody will want to be on Taylor Loop Road. Um, uh, we did agree to limit the timing of con construction activities uh, so that uh, you know, they would start no earlier than 7.30 in the morning and they'll cease at 6 o'clock at night and no equipment will be started any earlier than 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, and we've agreed that we'll not begin any construction till on this project till all the plans have been approved by the city of Little Rock. Uh, on the eastern portion of the project coming out of uh, the cul-de-sac in the southeast corner, uh, we've got an emergency access which goes over to Breon Drive, which then ties into Rawling Road. Uh, Deltic has agreed to construct that access in a manner so that if in the future the residents of the subdivision want to install gates on that It'll be gated for the fire department right now, but if they want to install gates that the residents of the subdivision can use to provide access in and out only to residents of that subdivision across this access, that we're going to design it so that that can be accomplished. Um, in terms of the additional notes that came up today, Donna, this is on that second sheet. Um, we clarified the plantings that we would be making on the slope but south of Madison Valley. Uh, the timeliness of those plantings. Uh, along that slope, we're going to plant oaks and maples at 50 foot on centers in two staggered rows, one and a half to one inch, one inch to one and a half inch caliber. Lob volley pine saplings at 10 inches on centers throughout the slope. And there'll be a hydro cedar with weeping love grass. And that's on the slope area outside of the 50 foot area that we're preserving. Uh, in the areas where we're doing advanced grading closer than 50 feet, we're going to come back with the evergreen screening, which are giant green giant arborvitae, big tall green plants. Uh, and um, the, we've also on the preliminary plat, we've shown the distance that the new lots will be away from Madison Valley. The rear lot lines on the new lots vary anywhere from 90 to 125 feet away from the rear lot lines on Madison Valley. And what that means is, is that houses in this subdivision, the, the rear of the house uh, will be separated from the rears of the house in Madison Valley by well over 100 feet. So there will be a good spatial gap between the two subdivisions. Um, again, this subdivision was originally prepared in 2005. We, Deltic did not pursue it at that point in time. 
Uh, they did construct some of the improvements because we built a large water line through the middle of what is phase 30. Uh, let's see, the, that's somewhat uh, of a, a condensed version of everything. Uh, did I get everything? Yes. Uh, and the other thing is, is that uh, within a year uh, of the slope, we will stabilize that slope and get the plantings in place within a year. Uh, the, typically, the seedlings, uh, the pine seedlings are available in January and February, and so that's the date that those things are all planted, and that we will get the uh, trees planted within a year of completion work on that slope. And if I've missed anything that it's, it's inadvertent, oh, we also added a 25-foot uh, uh, undisturbed buffer on the western edge of the project, where we over near La Marche Road. And that's shown on the plat, and also a condition of this plat is that 25-foot undisturbed buffer uh, on the western portion of this project. All right. Thank you, Mr. Nader. If, if, we reserve, if there's any questions, we'd be happy to answer them later then. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that and uh, addressing those important issues, which, which If the know. commission's good, I'm not going to read this four-page letter into the record, and I, we'll just make sure that it's all incorporated into the minute record. I, I think we've got a good synopsis of it uh, from Mr. Daters. Thank you. Um, so with that, I'll go to uh, cars who uh, wanted to speak in opposition. Uh, of course, reserving uh, uh, time for Mr. Spivey, who has 12 <laughs> minutes. So, uh, Matt Duncan. Joseph Peroni. I just want to say that, uh, you know, on, on behalf of myself uh, and my family, we appreciate working with Mr. Spivey and Mr. Naders uh, and Deltic Timber. They've really been, you know, good neighbors and have been open to suggestions that our family has had and uh, appreciate their, their efforts. Thank you. Uh, Sylvia Delsum? Delsum? Yeah. Delsum. I'm Sylvia Delsum, Delsum, president of the Madison Valley POA. So I do have to agree um, with Mr. Daters and Mr. Spivey. Um, we have Donna knows, as sure as, sure as Mr. Vince back there knows, we have gone back and forth a lot in the last two weeks. Um, we started out miles apart, and then we've come to this today. and. They've really give, worked with us. They've explained things to us. So at this point, Madison Valley is pleased with what they've done. We just want to reiterate that when this moves forward to the public works, the drainage and stuff, that we're included in those conversations and design to ensure everybody can sleep at night because there's a lot of concern. We have a lot of water that's already coming into the subdivision. Um, so that is our biggest concern. And the other thing, I don't know if it can be considered, is that gate on Rawlings. We really would like to see Deltic make it a completed aesthetic gating so that way the POA would just be able to determine they'll make it gated for all their residents or not use it, but not put that additional cost or waiting on a POA to come into effect. And the reason we're asking for that is we're trying to help alleviate some of the traffic on Taylor Loop. They don't go to Cantrell. They go to Taylor Loop, Taylor Loop to Rawlings or Henson, and it's only getting worse. Don Roberts School, they've done several subdivisions along La Marche, and it just keeps increasing and increasing. So that's why we're asking for that to be put there. That way the new subdivision has that option to exit their own or enter their own subdivision but otherwise again thank you both Vince thank you and Donna thank you thank you Barbara Lee Barbara Lee no uh, Ken Harrison nope. Emily Russ they left the building. Mindy Morrell. That's it. Okay. They were all here on the Hamilton Apartments and also on the 15,000 Cantor Road. Okay. Well, they decided not to stay yeah. for this. They did fill like cards for this issue. Um, all right. We have the DePippas. We'll start with uh, John DePippa, please.
Chairman Barry, uh, Vice Chair Bubbis, members of the Commission. My name is John DePippa, and I live at One Deming Court, which is at the northwest part of the development, right there at the entrance. I have two concerns that relate to privacy and traffic. Um, the entrance, which I think would be the main entrance, comes right by my house. Mr. Daters and Mr. Spivey were very kind to work with me, and as I see the revised plat, it has the undisturbed buffer, and that's fine. I don't represent my neighbors to my east, but I think they would also appreciate the same undisturbed buffer from my property line east of that. My second concern, however, is with traffic. Um, it seems to me the majority of traffic will be entering on the development from La Marche, and a considerable portion of that will be entering quite literally in my front yard. Um, if you use the usual multipliers at about 250 uh, units times eight trips per day, it's a lot of trips, um, potentially 2,000 vehicles in and out of that development. While not all of that will come by my house, a considerable portion of it will. Uh, with Don Roberts and the other development in the area, the traffic on the marsh and then on Taylor Loop are increasing. I would prefer that the development include a requirement that that gate for access to and uh, access from the development to Rawling be included as part of the development rather than leave it to an unstated potential future. Um, Mr. Daters once advised me that I shouldn't depend on my neighbors to preserve my privacy. I think that's a fair statement, and so I would like to defend on you and your approval of the plat to preserve my privacy. Um, so for those reasons, I would request that that undisturbed buffer extend further east along that boundary line, and second, that the gate for access to La Marche be included in part of the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pippa. Karen? I'm Karen DePippa, and hello, all commissioners. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. We appreciate the efforts of Mr. Daters and Mr. Spivey to help us with our buffer. And while it won't affect us directly, <laughs> the remainder of the development I would just like at this time to go on the record to request as much green space as possible to avoid clear cutting, which is what we watched when La Marche was built, um, just to help reduce more of the light pollution, air pollution, utility usage. I think in this time we all ought to be more environmentally conscious particularly with climate change. This is something that hasn't been built yet, so we do have an opportunity to present more green space if it's possible to change. I know it's probably a little late in the game to change the entire development. We weren't aware of any of the developments that were happening around us when we purchased our home in 2005, but we've come to recognize it's happening, so I'm just asking that you try and preserve as much as possible for that. I do want to reiterate the traffic on La Marche <clears throat> and Taylor Loop because for those persons who attend Don Roberts Elementary in the mornings during rush hour, Taylor Loop is backed up um, almost point to point at certain points of the day. So that will add more traffic if the back gate is not available for people to enter and exit on the Rowling side as well. So those were my points, so I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Spivey? Actually, I think all the rebuttals, as such as it is, uh, is Mr. Daters. I do want to point out something, and, and, I, and I appreciate comments from our neighbors because um, Mr. Daters, mostly, he kind of let me tag along, really has worked to try and address these concerns. As you all know on the Planning Commission, some concerns go far beyond the scope of a particular development. Uh, before La Marche was open, uh, traffic on Rolling and traffic on Schnell Parkway was really intense, and what La Marche has helped do is to rebalance it across the entire area. I mean, Mr. Peters here, he could probably give us a dissertation on it. I think that, obviously, um, we're not unmindful of those concerns, 
there's a limit as to what we can probably do with one particular development to address it. Nevertheless, it's not outside the scope of what we're interested in, and we want to be good neighbors. Um, I think I'm going to let Tim, because I'm going to dodge the hard questions, talk to you about the buffer and the back gate and, and then see where we get with this. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Mr. Daggers. Thank you. Commissioner, um, we can't extend that buffer. We don't really intend on any work. Uh, it can, it, we can extend it further eastward. Uh, I don't know exactly how far we can, but we will extend that buffer as far eastward as we, as we can that Mr. DePippa had mentioned. Uh, our intention on the, the so-called rear gate to this project is that to, com to comply with the city ordinances, we'll have to build a gate at, at the end of Brion Lane and, and also a gate up at the, the cul-de-sac. And what we'll do is we'll make sure that all the construction of those is stuff that, that does not have to be replaced if it's converted to a gate that's operated by a remote operator. So what we'll do is we'll construct the physical gates. They'll remain locked with the fire department having a key. But if, the, if once the association is complete and the residents are in the subdivision, they decide that they want to have another way to get in and out and that it's important for them on a daily basis to have that, then they'll be able to build upon the work that Deltic has constructed with a, a relative modest expense actually construct the actuators and the remote control mechanisms that, that it take to get that done. Um, but we but we will make all the work that we complete at this place will be towards that that end. Uh, these property owners associations typically start with a surplus because they're funded completely from the day that the lots are platted. Uh, and so they typically build up a surplus during the first two or three years before they're fully occupied. So there will be funds available and they do have the resources. I think these two subdivisions uh, have about 16 acres of open space between them. So they'll have some uh, expenses in terms of maintaining open spaces and things like that. And the, and the construction or maintenance of a gate is not, is not going to be a big issue should they decide that they want to do it. Okay. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Anything else from the applicant? Uh... No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right, commissioners. Questions, comments? Yes, Mr. Stebbins. That that road is a is a it's not on the master street plan. It is a collector street. It runs a, the two tracks adjacent to it are MF12 and MF6. Uh, that road is was constructed by District 14, which those two parcels are in. And when those two parcels are developed, they'll take access off of Brion. There's a there's a median cut there in Raleigh Road, and then a right turn lane. And I believe that was constructed in. Um, my memory will fail me somewhere around 2009, I believe, or something like that, but, but around that time, and that was one of the projects for District 14. District 14 also constructed uh, La Marche uh, through Deltic's property and the, some of the sewer main and water main extensions. And those two tracks are owned by Deltic as well? That's correct. <clears throat> okay. Other commissioners? Commissioner May. Isn't it nice? Thanks for noting that. Any other commissioners? I'll be back uh, next month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no other comments? Questions? Commissioner Bobby? Um, I guess we need to note that he's amending his application to extend the buffer to the east. And as and add the gates as well as included in the letter dated august 31st 2017. okay so that all of those are in there and they don't need to be they will be yeah as amended to include okay everything he's offered today including the letter did that address the issue that you were bringing up mr de pippa would that be in addition to the letter as long as i understand the yeah the gates are not a part of it well so do we need to amend it for the gates because he said he will do all the construction for the gates except for the actuators and the remotes if I, that's, in, that's, in there. that's in there okay that did, did that address your issue 
you want to, yes. I think my, my issue is not with the construction of the gates. I, that's fine. My issue is whether or not the gates will be open from the moment the subdivision is developed rather than wait until the POA at some future time decides whether or not the POA wants to have access to Rollin. What I would like the, appro the approval to include is that there be access to Rollin through that gate now without waiting for the future POA approval. Does that make sense? Yes, Thank you. I understand that now. Thank you. And actually, I do have one more question about the buffer. And so I want to make sure I understand that if I, if I can. That extension of the buffer to the east was not in the letter from this afternoon. So that will be amended. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Okay. That is correct. Um, applicant, uh, the gate issue <laughs> he just mentioned, do you, do you Mr. Dares, want to address that, that immediately be open? We're not prepared to place the gates in immediate operation. Uh, we prefer to let that happen as, as the, the option of the POA, the people who live in that subdivision. Okay. So before we make a motion, then it appears that we there's a distinct amendment in addition to the letter regarding the eastward uh, extension of the buffer. Is that correct? Okay. And so that has been noted. Okay. Uh, move for approval of item B with all staff recommendations and comments. Plus the amendment, sorry, or the buffer. As amended. Thank you. Okay. Second. Second. Motion has been made and seconded uh, for this application as amended and with staff recommendations. Those for it, raise your hand. Those opposed? Okay. Application passes. We're going to move on to the next item before kickoff time. By the way, it's on. By the way, it's on the SEC network. If you have that channel, so. Item number H. File number Z-9219, Mickle Short Form PDC, located at 2904 South Arch Street. The applicant is requesting rezoning of the site from R4 two-family district to PDC, Plan Development Commercial, to allow the use of an existing one-and-a-half-story frame house as a beauty salon. The applicant has indicated the salon will house up to four operators. The building contains 1,106 square feet on the first floor and 448 square feet on the second level. The applicant is proposing to extend the existing drive from South R Street to the rear yard, allowing one-way access to the rear yard and to place a paved parking area within the rear yard. The customers will then exit the site onto the existing alley located behind the homes, which is paved the entire length from West 29th to West 30th Street. Parking for the beauty salon is typically based on one parking space per 200 gross square feet of floor area. The typical parking required for a structure containing the 1554 square feet is seven spaces. In addition to the salon use, the site contains an existing accessory dwelling within the rear yard. The accessory dwelling will remain, which would typically require an additional parking space. The applicant is proposing to provide four parking spaces in the rear yard of the home the applicant has also provided a letter of agreement from a nearby business, True Riders Motorcycle Club, located at 2822 South Arch Street, to utilize 8 to 10 parking spaces and also to use the back parking lot if additional parking is needed to support her salon use. The applicant has indicated signage will be placed within the front yard of the home. The sign is proposed with the maximum height of 6 feet, maximum sign area of 24 square feet. Building signage will be limited to 10% of the front facade area. The hours of operation are indicated um, Monday through Saturday from 8 to 7, although the applicant has indicated probably most Mondays won't be open. But the stylist will set the appointments uh, and provide their own schedules. The lot is 50 foot wide, which does not allow for typical minimum required landscape strip along the northern and southern perimeters adjacent to the proposed drive extending from South Arch Street to the rear yard, nor the parking pad within the rear yard. Adjacent to the drive along the southern perimeter, a one-foot, eight-inch landscape strip is proposed. As the drive extends into the rear yard, the landscape strip along the northern-southern perimeters is indicated at five feet. 
Since the site is located within the designated mature area of the city, the landscape ordinance would allow the a reduction in the landscape strip to six feet nine inches. The zoning ordinance for as far as land use buffering would also allow it to be reduced to six feet nine inches. Staff is not supportive of the applicant's request. The site is located within an area that is single family residential and is indicated as residential low on the city's future land use plan. Although there are commercial uses located to the north, the commercial uses do not extend south of West 29th Street, and staff does not feel this is an appropriate location for the placement of commercial business. Staff recommends denial of the request. Thank you, staff. Is the applicant here, please? Good evening to everyone that's on the panel. panel. Um, she's correct with what she said. But we are going to remove the building in the back, so there will be uh, accurate parking. And the motorcycle club, which is 20 foot, I guess, from my beauty salon, that they gave me permission to park over there. They are not open through the week. So we can utilize that parking space. Um, most of the time, the beauty shop will be um, appointments only, so it won't be a lot of traffic in and out of the uh, salon. And it's a Christian uh, facility we're bringing into the community. We're trying to make something happen in that community. My mother have lived there for 20 years. Nothing positive really in that community. So I just want to bring this business into the community so there will be some positive activity going on for the young people that's there. I do do ministry out there uh, on weekends. So. And so if I tie that building down, I can possibly get like four to five cars back in the back rear. Okay. Thank you. Do you have anything else you want to say? You may want, I have a card on this. You may want to speak to to their issues after they get up and speak. So oh, you don't sure. Have that. Right. Okay. Sure. Okay. Of course. Thank you. Rosalind Scruggs, please. Mr. Chairman and members of the commission, my name is Rosalind Scruggs. I live at 2904 South, 2900 South Arch. I live next door to the proposed beauty shop. I am in support of Ms. Mickle's idea for the beauty shop. However, I feel that it is in the wrong place. Uh, it should be in a different location. As was mentioned earlier, it is a residential area. The uh, proposal that she is making regarding construction of a parking lot to the backyard is adjacent to my backyard. So uh, tearing down that building, uh, tearing, taking down those beautiful trees in the backyard uh, would really be a hindrance to the appearance of the, the, the dwelling. Uh, especially, effect, pardon me, affecting my property. I um, feel that her vision is good. However, it needs to be in another location. And uh, I am opposed to it being at that location. Not to her idea, but I'm opposed to it being in that location right next door to my house. Thank you, Mrs. Scruggs. App, would you like to... Would you like to say anything else? Yes, uh, the trees that she's talking about is on my property. They are going to be taken out anyway because of the stumps. So those trees will be removed. And I don't think the beauty shop will bring any kind of harm to her property. I think it will add uh, increased value to the community. Um, I mean... It would be something positive going on for the young people that live there, low-income families for their children. So. Thank you. Uh huh. Thank Appreciate you. That. Commissioners. Commissioner Stebbins. I was just curious, where was the additional parking with, did you say a motorcycle club? Yes. Yes, it's a motorcycle club. 
motorcycle club and additional parking, that motorcycle club can hold up to over 20 cars or more. Where, where is that? It's right off of 2800 block. Uh, I think it's where the cursor is, right, Walter? Is that what, right there? Is that a business or a? It's a business, but it's not open through the week. And so they did give me permission to park over there because it's plenty of park and it's not far from the salon. Okay. Commissioner Hamilton. The, the property just south of your location, is, is that a resident as well? That's south of my location? Yes. Yeah, where the cursor is. Well, there is uh, several business around there. There's uh, Evans Motors. Um, um, so where the cursor is, that property that's there right there, is, is, is that a residential? That's right there on the corner? Right, right where the cursor is pointing. No, this is uh, the motorcycle club. That's a home. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> and then the, the the property rights south of that as well. That's are all these homes in that block? Yes. They are currently yes. okay. Sure. Okay. So the motorcycle club is right here. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or comments, commissioners? Okay. Uh, move for approval of item H with all staff recommendations and comments except that of denial. Thank you, Commissioner Bob. Do I hear a second? Okay. Uh, the motion has been made a second to approve this application uh, except for uh, that of staff recommendation of denial. So if you are for this application, raise your hand. Oh, no matter what. The okay. If you oppose this application raise your hand okay okay Sorry. well respect to all you all thank okay, you so well, thank much thank you so much okay. appreciate your initiative uh -huh. thank Ms. you miss michaels you you have the right of appeal to the mayor and board of directors so if you want to get with me i'll show you i'll help you uh-huh what uh what excuse me what what would you want to speak about Um, you know what? Let's do that after do that citizen communication uh, after this this next item. Because um, I believe item five it was on the consent agenda. But uh, you're welcome to speak during citizen communication. It it, it it was approved to move forward to the city board. It was not. It does not go to the board. So it is approved, uh, and this is the final uh, decision point on that. Anyhow, you're welcome to say something that says some communications after that, but that was, I don't know when you came in, I asked for cards, you know, multiple times, so. Uh, right. We just had questions about it, and we were told to come here about it. Okay. Right at four, so. Okay. Well, let's hear this next item first, and then I certainly don't mind you getting up and speaking. And, and Okay. Um, so, next item we all been waiting for. Item number 12, file number Z-9246-19400, Lawson Road, Long Form PCD, located behind 19400 Lawson Road at the end of Vicky Lane. The request is allow the placement of a 40 foot by 40 foot metal building on the property be used as a medical marijuana dispensary as defined by the City of Little Rock Zoning Ordinance. The plan indicates the placement of a paved parking area along the southern and western sides of the building. The applicant has indicated a minimum pavement width of 20 feet will be extended from the current end of the paving on Vicki Lane to the property. The applicant has indicated there will be a dumpster located on the site. The hours of dumpster service are limited to 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. The dumpster will be full, fully screened as typically required by the ordinance. The applicant has indicated signage will be placed on the front facade of the building. The sign will not exceed 10% of the front facade area. Ground signage is indicated 12 feet in height and 32 square feet in area. The days and hours of operation of the business are proposed from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Saturday. 
The plan indicates the placement of a 10-foot security fence around the perimeter of the site. The applicant notes the height and construction material of the fence is a requirement by the state licensing board. The fence will be a chain link fence. Staff is not supportive of the applicant's request. The applicant is seeking a rezoning of the site from residential to commercial to allow for commercial business on the site. The site is located at the end of a substandard street and is within a residential area. The commercial uses in this area are limited to Lawson, Lawson Road. There are no commercial uses located in the area along Beecham Road, which will be used as access to Vicki Lane and the site. The site is indicated on the future land use plan as residential low. This category typically uh, allows for low density residential uses, commonly single family homes, and staff does not feel it's an appropriate location for the placement of commercial use. Staff recommends denial. Okay. Thank you, staff. Uh, applicant, uh, would you please come up, please, and state your name and uh, present your case for your application. My name is Nathan Mann, and um, I appreciate you guys seeing me tonight. I've never had to do anything like this, so I really didn't have anything prepared to, you know, I, I, as far as what I needed to say, I hate to say it. Uh, but I do have two letters from residents of Vicki Lane. I don't know, can I give these to you guys or Don, I suppose? Steve, yeah, please. Uh, as far as uh, the area in question, I mean, we own pretty much most of the land around it, to be honest. We own around 40 acres on Lawson. This is the back side. The main reason we're wanting to put it in this area is because there is a, uh, a requirement uh, for the dispensary to be 1,500 foot from the closest church, school, or daycare. And honestly, that's the, that's the only area I could get to get within that requirement. Um, we do have, you know, as far as the access is coming off of Vicki Lane, and that is a, uh, a legal easement. And honestly, like I said, I'm, I'm really don't know what all I'd, I would need to do, but as far as I'm trying to cover all my bases here, to be honest. Um, and I just, I honestly asked you guys to, you know, you know, give this some thought. I mean, the main reason we want to do this, I think it would bring, a good amount of revenue to our neighborhood out where we live. I mean, I was born and raised there, as was three generations prior to me on this land. So, I mean, we've been there forever, me and my family. Um, I mean, as far as the surrounding area, I understand it's residential, but there's really not a lot of residents in that area, and most of them are for this, and I could, you know, I can get proof of that. They think it would bring into the other businesses that are located on Lawson Road. Uh, because you basically have to come right past them and if they're going to be out in that area doing business with us that could possibly bring business to the other businesses in that area um, and honestly i just uh another thing i think it would be good for us in this area you have a lot of people that are coming out there it's for medical use uh, and a lot of people it's serene it's off to itself and i really don't see how it would bother anybody where it's located to be honest um, and being as far back as it is off the beaten path, I believe it would give them, you know, kind of keep pop people calm. They'll be more comfortable coming to this area to get their medicine, to be honest. So if you guys would just, you know, give it some thought, see what you think, and I guess let me know what you think on it. Okay. Uh, thank you. We might have some questions or comments. Okay. Okay. South, yes. Other commissioners, comments? This is our first application for a dispensary. Uh, Y'all may recall that uh, we just passed the policy and the ordinance that we treat uh, dispensary applications as if they are retail pharmacies. Uh, and it would be consistent in that vein. So as you might imagine, if a pharmacy were to ask to um, apply for a zoning uh, out here for a pharmacy, what would our disposition be, the, having no access, public access and roads. Um, so anyhow, want to hear a motion? Or do you want to say anything? I move for approval of item number 12 with all stack recommendations and comments except that of denial. Lots of denials. Okay, do I hear a second to his motion? 
Uh, yes. I, I, I guess I'm perplexed as to where we're so, uh, we as a society are supposed to put these suckers. I agree, sir. It's, it's <laughs> 1,500 feet from everything known, everything that you would come in contact with, but yet we're in the dilemma of taking a site, and I don't know where Lo I know where Lost in the Marsh is, uh, kind of out there, <laughs> and and having to treat it like it's a pharmacy. Uh, I mean, I'm, were you here? The, pe the, pe the people passed the motion. I'm just not sure where we're going to end up putting dispensaries. Dispens well, I mean, dispensaries. that's a good question. Were Were you there when we had the the discussion on the the, the city ordinance regarding where? Maybe they did it on purpose. Well, yes, but <laughs> where do you find it? I just find it hard to find the physical site that coincides with the law and the pharmacy. It's hard to do, sir. I'll be honest. I'm lucky that I have the land I've got or I'd be in trouble. I wouldn't have a chance at all. That's why they, they, they did it. I understand. That's an interesting question. Appreciate it. So noted. Uh, we, we do have a motion. Commissioner May, did you want to say something? Yeah. Well, it could be pertinent. We're among friends. Well, the problem the city has with this, it's not zoned for a commercial entity anyhow. So, I mean, even though it may be a good place for it, it's not zoned for it. Okay. That was that was the that was the point of the city ordinance that we had passed. <laughs> well. There, I, I guarantee, there's uh, four dispensers will be allowed in Central Arkansas. I'll, I'll guarantee you, uh, if they pass the applications to the state, there'll be someone who will ask for a dispensary in a place currently zoned for that. I would be very surprised if we don't get another application uh, in a location where there's there's public access and already has a, a by right zoning for pharmacy. But I might be wrong. Um, you know, I guess the bucolic aspect of Dispensaries. Just never thought about that. But uh, uh, now, did I hear a second to the motion? Okay. Uh, so, uh, motion has been made to approve this application with staff recommendations. Accept that for denial. If you're for this application, raise your hand. All right. If those opposed. To the motion application, raise your hand. It's been turned down, so sorry. Okay. Do you have the right of appeal to the board of directors? If you'll get with me, I'll tell you what's needed to yep. do to to make that appeal process. Okay. Thank you. No, no. Ma'am, uh, would you like come to get up and approach the podium? If you had questions about that, I don't, you know, I know it's very complex uh, when we they go through consent agenda, but maybe staff can answer your questions now. Sure. Okay. Uh, my name is Cami Jones. I'm represent, representing the Wellington at Chanel Apartments, and item number five says that they will be building a Chanel Center, and we were just wanting to know if it would have any adverse impact on our property as far as the construction, shutting down our driveway, stuff like that. So I do apologize for the inexperience um, That's okay. that I have. Uh, staff, would you like to speak to that in terms of traffic? Um I can, but it might be better if you just come by, since the commission has already approved it. If you'll okay. just come by our office at 723 West Markham, I can sit down with you, show you their plans, show okay. you all the comments, okay. and I sure. think that'd be a whole lot easier than trying to do Absolutely. it here. So, 8 to 5, Monday through Friday, 723 okay. West Markham, which is two blocks to the to the west corner of Markham and State Street, Got first it. floor. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. No problem. Any other for citizens communications before kickoff? Okay, we're adjourned. <laughs>